welcome once more to the Reality Report and it's a special edition where I'm uh, following up a conversation I had over, over a year ago, mid-September 2018 I last spoke to Jane Claire Jones here. Welcome back Jane. Hello. And uh, so here we are on a damp Sunday afternoon in it's Brighton. Rim. Yeah. Um, but very nice to be, 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 be back in conversation. Mm. Um, now, last time we spoke about initially about Judith Butler, the, the um, well, often called feminist philosopher, but um, third way <laughs> feminist philosopher. Allegedly feminist philosopher. Yeah, um, and her seemingly bizarre claim that biological sex was a social construct. And from that rather esoteric position, we then um, ended up discussing how that idea has surfaced into popular culture and manifested in language, policy, law, and so on. And an awful lot's happened in the last year. So it's quite difficult to know even where to begin, but I think um, one very relevant topic that's going on as we speak, uh, there's a woman called Maya Forstato. Is that a correct pronunciation? Yes, I, b okay. I believe so. Right, yes. so do you want to tell us a little bit about the Maya Forstato case, because you've been following this more closely than I. Uh, so Maya was, um, well, she, she, she wrote a blog She's working for the Centre for Global Development, okay, which, which, I, which I believe is a development think tank. Um, she was fired from her position. She was a consultant, so one of the issues with the case is, is actually to do with her employment status, but that's not the main issue. So she was fired from her, from her position at the Centre for Global Development for, um, I think, writing a blog post and also for some tweets that she made. Um, in which she was basically asserting kind of fundamental points of gender critical feminism. Um, so, I mean, obviously this is a large and complicated issue, but I would say that the fundamental bones of contention are around the understanding of the relationship of sex and of gender, and the kind of contradictory interpretations of those within what we call trans ideology, mm -hmm. and the type of feminism that considers itself to be incompatible with trans ideology, let's say that. So the basic differences would be that, that we believe that sex is um, a given material, an objective, an, an objective given material reality. Biological reality. That a, give, a given, a given yeah. natural biological reality. And that we believe that gender is principally a um, system of power Mm. and a set of social roles and uh, characteristics which are prescribed to people of each sex yeah. in order to um, maintain a power structure. So, uh, very loosely speaking, enforced sex stereotypes that, that serve a role. Enforced sex stereotypes are one of the main elements yeah. of gender, mm. but I think I would say gender is a much bigger system okay. than just enforced but sex A system of, of power dynamics that, that at least initially appears in the, in the form of um, one of its most notable, one of the most notable places where it appears mm. is in enforced sex roles. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so to, just to clarify for people who thought that the words gender and sex were just synonyms, because that's a very common uh, belief among They the kind of are in some context, and this is part of the problem. I mean, sometimes yeah. we joke that we actually think this entire problem was created because they changed the, the word sex on the sex box to yeah. gender. Yeah. So now most forms say gender, mm. male, female. It started in the United States, I think in the 50s, and it was a, it was a squeamishness about the word sex. Uh, effectively, it was an American prudishness that led to replacing the word sex, which everybody agreed on and understood with a word from philology, I think, from language, the study of language, it was nouns, um, you know, people had sex. Case, cases. And, um, yeah, male, masculine and feminine. Um, Mas masculine, feminine and neuter. Yeah, so that, that's in, those, in, in, in um, spread out languages primarily, yeah. isn't it? So you know, that was the gender. But anyway, the word gender started to be used as a synonym for sex. And then, perhaps to confuse matters, as I understand it, the, the second wave feminists in the 60s and 70s started to use gender in the way you described it, which was... Well, I mean, this is this is one of the interesting things, is that this actually went through sexology into... So, John Money and oh. the people who were doing that sexological work... OK. Well, when was that? 50s and 60s. OK, right. So, um, it went from philology, and then it was taken, I believe, and I think the first case... 
uh, uh, those people who were doing sex research in John Hopkins around about that time and other people who were working in that field and it went from there into feminism. Okay. Right? And then... So they'd started to play with the word and use it as a, in a broader way. Right. So, I mean, it is actually interesting in so far as, like, the concept of gender identity that was being used by money predated the feminist concept of gender. Oh, okay. But then the feminist concept of gender became the dominant understanding of the meaning of gender. Yeah, inside, up until... Up until 10, ago, 10 yeah. 15 years ago. Mm. And then third wave feminism, to some extent, Butlerian queer theory took the concept of gender and made it more agential, right? right so then so it became something that was much more to do with individual choice. And performance and so and on. And performance. Yeah. And so in a way there was elements of, the two things have at this point become confused in, in a way which you sort of had to be a, a philosopher to, to untangle in a way. Um, most people, you know, there's, there's just, you're, you're a man or a woman, you're male or female, um, and some people don't necessarily conform to the stereotypes. And we've had a, a, a kind of common language to discuss those kinds of things. Um, but suddenly everybody's really confused. We have people saying, but there are only two genders. And other people going, no, no, there are loads more than two genders. And, and the people saying there are only two genders, are, what they're trying to assert is that there are two biological sexes, that, that but mammalian they're using, they're sexes. Use, they're using the wrong word. They're using the wrong word at that point. Yeah. And a lot of people just don't know which word they're supposed to use. No. Um, it's a complete mess. Yeah. And a lot of feminists are now saying that we need to remove the word gender. We need to give up on the yeah. word gender and we need to replace that word with another word. It, it isn't really helping anymore. I get that feeling. It's just leading I've to I've got no idea what word to replace it with. No. No, I mean, I do see people, <laughs> I do see people just swapping out sex stereotypes because that, in, in a lot of sort of um, rhetorical scenarios, that, that's quite a helpful way of illuminating what's really being said. But, like you it, said, that's not really capturing the whole thing of what is what was meant. The, mecha the mechanism, I mean, strictly speaking, I would say, mm. gender is the entire social mechanism by which patriarchal hierarchy is maintained. Okay. So it includes, uh, you know, the things that we would call gender-based violence, yeah. right? So rape culture mm. is part of gender. Yeah, and, right? and, and socialisation of children. Socialisation. Yeah. Like male violence, um, cultural values, mm -hmm. like so. There's so so actually, we'll we'll get on to talk about this, right? Um, the the tendency in our culture to um, denigrate materiality yeah. and elevate ideas and um, the non-material aspects of, of of existence over the material aspects of being. Mm -hmm. That's part of gender. Right. In and the largest yeah, sense. Yeah, so. so, I mean, at that point then, though, gender simply means the power mechanism through which patriarchal hierarchy or male dominance is maintained. Yeah. And it, so it's a description of all of those power mechanisms. And it's a kind of, it's a single word for a monolithic, well, oh no, a multifaceted thing. Right. Whereas people talk about this gender or that gender, which gender is this person, you know, so that that use of it is really not compatible with the one that you're describing well that's one so, of the problems yeah, that, this is that's part one of the problem, part of the problem we get um, into. but but anyway i just wanted you to clarify that that issue so so are we my, clarifying maybe we are <laughs> maybe everyone's just scratching their heads some of you know about all this a lot of people watching already know this stuff i but, think i think we are unclarifying yeah. um, <laughs> maybe we're just giving some some uh, hint as to how complicated this stuff gets once you start digging into it. To, to come down to the, 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 the core of, of, of our claims, mm. the core of our claims are biological sex is real yeah. and gender is a system of power and a set of social constructs yeah. uh, in order, which function to maintain sexed hierarchies, yes. right? male, male dominance over female people. Mm. So <clears throat> we think that the system of power is sex-based and we think the mechanism of power that maintains Same that sex-based hierarchy yeah. is called gender. Yeah. And we don't think people have genders. No. Right? Because we think, I th we think people have personalities yeah. and we think those personalities are gendered by our society, yes. but we don't think people have genders. No, like, there's that's not some intrinsic thing. There's not yeah. some intrinsic thing. And, and that essentially what uh, 
trans ideology or whatever else principally and let's take out the question of dysphoria mm. okay but what trans ideology is principally talking about is effectively the multiplicity of personalities as they intersect with the cultural coding of gender could you just just briefly unpack that so you're talking about the fact that you know it possibly it's possible to be biologically female or biologically male and still um, adopt any of a huge range of possible personalities right and in some cases nobody bats an eyelid you're, you've got a stereotypically masculine personality in a male body if you deviate from that then then all sorts of problems arise right. socially and right. culturally right. And, and various people are right. theorizing around that right but even so but our claim would always be that the you know because so we're not denying we're not denying that people have personalities, no. obviously. <laughs> like, and they have natural dispositions and aptitudes. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not even denying, this is a bone of some contention, but I would not deny that there is an extremely, extremely loose bimodal distribution in some aspects of so personality. personality traits between male and female humans that might be... In the, in the very broadest right. sense. Yeah. Right, yeah, that's, so, that's something So I'm prepared about. to accept claims like males tend to be more object oriented and females tend to be more person oriented yeah. Think very broad things like yeah that. As, as a statistical as tendency, a statistical not every, as a, as a yeah. statistical tendency yeah. Yeah. right but and this is very important because that statistical tendency is very wide that binary these are male people and they have masculine personalities mm. and these are female people and they have feminine personalities doesn't hold no, at all. There's this huge bit in the middle. of Because there's a yeah, massive, yeah. massive, massive range of people in the middle who mm. show massive variability, you know, and that's just natural. The construction of the boxes as being extremely rigid is a product of society, and then there are certain aspects of the construction of those boxes that are entirely, um, that are entirely social, right? Okay. There is nothing, I think, in inherent, any inherent whatever personality traits that we could call um, female that means that female people are not capable of uh, moving through space in a way that um, expresses agency, right? Mm. All of the, there's lots of very famous work, for example, on how, how women are culturally taught to kind of fold their bodies in and take up less space and oh, right. move move around people so we, you know right. the, the very famous thing about manspreading that everyone thought was hilarious but actually it's very it's actually a very good exemplification of the way in which men are men are taught to use their bodies to occupy to space. occupy space and manspreading if you've missed it it's like men on trains sort of sitting with their knees wide apart to sort of dominate and and, 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 what, and what you will notice is that is that the women fold themselves up yeah. and and many many women have done this if you if you refuse to do that and you put your legs if you refuse to fold your legs in mm. the man next to you just keeps pushing against yeah, you so right. you end it's, you end mm. up sitting there with your knee pressed against a stranger yeah because yeah. because they're, they're, they're just not aware and or they don't think they need to accommodate other people's space mm. so yeah I, I've heard um, women describing not getting out of the way of men walking straight towards them right but just standing their ground and they, and they walk into you yeah they, yeah they just expect women to and, and most men are unaware this is going on because they don't need to do anything they just walk where they want to go they just walk where they want to go and women get out, get out the way, the way. <laughs> yeah. but what you're saying is that's that's a kind of box that's been constructed there's nothing intrinsic inherent or genetic that no but and, that. and 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 it's a it's a it's a very important exemplification of, of something that's that's actually very close to the core of the mechanism mm which is that women bend around men. Okay, right, so right. it's just making that almost geometrically obvious, but it, it, you're saying it, that in it's, a conceptual it's a kind of, sense. Yeah. In a conceptual philosophical sense, that's very close to what the core agenda yeah, is. Right. Male entitlement and women bending themselves and servicing yeah. those needs. Mm -hmm. And that I think what, what's interesting about that stuff about bodily comportment and the way in which we move through public space is that they're very obvious, spatialised representations of something that's actually very cool. Yeah. Um, and those things are in no sense innate. No. Women are not women are not kinds of creatures who are born realizing that they just have to move out of the way for male creatures. That's just not how that works. No. Um, so there's lots of aspects of it, and lots of aspects, for example, of the performance, the aesthetic performances of femininity that are very much about. If you look at a lot of the aspects of femininity, they're all 
not all, but a, a large number of them revolve around constricting and restricting women's movements, women's occupation of space, the way in which they assert themselves, the way in which they use their voices, like all kinds of things mm. like that. They're to do with restricting expressions of subjectivity and agency. Right. So you don't get that from, even if we accept something like men are more object oriented and women are more person oriented, um, to get from that to when we get out of the way of men, that doesn't, yeah, one right, doesn't follow or, or from the other. One or, doesn't follow from the yeah. other, right? One of them is very clearly in the yeah. interest of power. So, and yeah, so, so what I think you, you, you seem to be saying, some, some of these deeper, subtle, perhaps, <laughs> arguable, but, arguable, but you're willing to entertain the possibility of, some of these differences, um, say, object-oriented versus person-oriented, this might be sort of hardwired. I mean, I, I literally think we have no way of telling. Okay. Right? Because there is, there is a sort of blank slate uh, ideology in some areas of feminism that there's absolutely no difference and then there's more subtle positions like or more conciliatory positions like yours so there could be some intrinsic difference. I mean my my position on any given thing is going to be that it is an interaction of nature and culture yeah right I don't believe there is any phenomenon in human society that is singularly natural or singularly cultural okay. so it is when when these arguments were originally made, the I mean Kate Millett's argument in, in sexual politics, for example, there may have been an extent to which there was a desire to hammer home the claim that gender was principally social, in a way that may have led people to think that it was based on a on a on a totally blank slatist. Yeah. yeah. Um, I and there are still there are still um, there are still some people out there who will argue for a blank slatist position. I would not argue from a for a blank slatist position simply because I don't think there is anything that exists in the world that is purely cultural. Um, and I think there's always going to be some natural dimension. Mm -hmm. What I would argue is whatever natural dimension there may be, you cannot get from there to the massive hierarchical power structure that we have and i actually think the, the you know given how things are all play things are playing out now right i'm it's very important for me to both be able to critique power hierarchies and also um remain in touch with reality yeah. <laughs> so i think I mean, I think the best version to give is the version that is both closest to reality. And I think the power, I, I mean, I think that the critique of the way in which gender principally functions in order to serve social and political power interests mm. is true, right? I don't think you, I don't think, you know, if we're talking about the things that we're talking about, right? I don't think it's the case that um, one, one should necessarily believe that, you know, like, yeah, the organisation of public space is naturally given, because why would it be, right? But I do think that it's important that um, feminist analysis recognises givens and that we construct an analysis of power that, that um, makes sense within the nature of what we understand about the materiality and the givenness of the world because otherwise we're not producing analysis that's actually useful it has to be rooted in something real um, this yeah. is one of the things that's going on with trans ideology right the argument about the relationship between nature and culture in relation to social organization is ultimately always about what can be politically changed mm -hmm. and what can't be politically changed that's what's at stake the problem in leftist thinking is it's decided that everything can be changed because uh, historically, I and mean, I think we talked about this before, historically the critique of ideology was that ideology is uh, functions to make natural, um, to make socially constructed things look natural. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So the best way to convince people that they can't socially change a power mechanism is to try and convince them it's natural, yeah. right? But then if you want to start changing power mechanisms, you, you, you start going, oh, no, that isn't natural. But then you can go so far as to claim... That nothing is natural. Yes, yeah. I, I think last time I asked you, do you think some of these people would claim that gravity was a social construct and that was down yes. to answer? 
that they probably give it a go because you know they're, they're suspicious of any claim of anything being natural we've got we've um, got we've got to a point where a lot of people on the left knee-jerk think that any claim to nature is inherently conservative yeah um which is actually fucking insane yeah i mean the, the simple <laughs> if anyone's losing the thread here it's just like you know classic thing conservative is you know opposed to homosexual relations because it's not natural they say it's not. You don't see that in the natural world. We'll, right, or, or, uh, yeah. or, that, or that women should stay in the home and look after children. Yeah, that's the natural way. That's the look, natural look way at the animal things. kingdom, so on. And so people have quite rightly kicked back against that and said, no, actually, um, that's not the case. And that you can't constrain us in that way. But you go too far and suddenly you're arguing, as the prosecution lawyer in the Maya Forstater cases just a couple of days ago, arguing that biological sex, as we understand it, you know, just the basic reproductive mechanism whereby we all got here, arguing that that is um, a conspiracy theory, right? an incoherent belief, an irrational belief. Right. Um, so this is, this is like the left effect. Well, is it the left? I don't know if you could even call it the left, but um, you've got, it's yeah, an ideological it's the, 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 it's, it's It's the side that considers themselves to be progressive. Yeah. Let's, let's say that. Yeah. I don't think you can call them leftists in any conventional sense mm. because they have no material analysis. analysis. Yeah, so the, the, the left-right thing is, is being kind of... People, these words get thrown around now in ways which aren't really helping. But yeah, so the, the kind of self-proclaimed progressive faction who have forced Maya Forstater out of her job, because I don't think her employers were, were tra trawling around through her blog post. Somebody who had an issue with her reported her. Uh, I don't know about that, actually. Okay. I, would have to, I, would have to, I would have to check on that. Right, it, might, it might have been. It seems like the CDC... Yeah. I mean, you did hear that the, one of the witnesses for the CDC stood up and what basically... What's the CDC again? The Centre for... Oh, sorry, CG, CG, CGC. Yeah, the Centre for Global... Global C, CGD. CGD, OK, oh. right, yeah. CGD. Yeah, Three-letter acronym, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> Three-letter acronym beginning with C. Um, got up and asserted that Rachel Dolezal was black. Okay. That was the bit where where we all just went because she she was black because she simply because she self ID'd as black. Right, because there is a st strand of thinking now, right? That mm. I mean, I think this is a massive extension. All claims to naturalness are inherently conservative. The progressive position to advance now is that all identity claims are self-determinant. And we said this a while ago, when, when this conflict began in relation to the attempt to argue that biological sex was a construction, we were obviously saying, well, if that's the case, then then this is going to refer to all other forms of material facets of people's being. Mm. So you'll have people who can claim they're transracial. You'll have people who claim they're they are trans age. You'll have trans able. Yeah. Trans able. And these are all things. I mean, there are it's small numbers trans, of people. Tra trans rich. Oh right, yeah, trans and trans, trans economic. Trans, yeah. trans economic. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Rachel Dolezal again. American viewers may know of her and, and some people who've been following this debate. But she was a woman with no um, African. Uh, sort of she is white. background. She's a white woman. She's white. <laughs> um, who basically sort of has seemed to have an affinity with Afro-American culture. Um, curled her hair. You know, she had some. Skin. She had some. She had some black um, adopted siblings. Yeah. So she had, and I think she identified a lot with them. She identified with the culture, but she she vis she made herself look like she could be of African descent. She made about. herself look like a, a, an extremely light-skinned African. -American. Yeah, and then ended up working for with blue eyes. Yeah, <laughs> what was? Yeah, right. What was the organisation of the, the National Advance Association for the yeah, Advancement of yeah, Coloured yeah, People? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the NWACP. So the, the, the big, the big organisation which has been representing African Americans for decades. She ended up high up in that organisation, and then it got revealed that I think she is. I think she was one of the leaders of the. She was. She's from Spokane in Washington. Yeah. So she's one of the leaders. She had a quite senior position in the, N in the NAACP, yeah. NAACP chapter in Spokane. Right. Before it was revealed by her parents. Okay. In some nasty interpersonal oh, family issue, because right. her parents are allegedly fairly abusive. Yeah. Um, so they kind of outed her. She as... outed. They outed her as a white woman. Yeah. And then there was huge outrage that this white woman should be so um, deceptive, manipulative as to get herself into that <laughs> position. 
but she basically right. claimed that she identified as black. And we've seen it in, well, there are several people who've come to prominence online who, who aren't disabled, but identify as if they are and go around in wheelchairs. Um, there was, there's a white student uh, leader, Benjamin something, have you seen him? Oh, he, yes. he identified as black in order to try and get the position as, as the black and minority and then, ethnic officer And then he's the been on television yeah. a number of times arguing the trans rights position. He's, yeah, he's been he's arguing. extremely patronising and pious yeah. about it. Some people are born into the wrong body. No. And the truth yeah. is, the conversion therapy that they face is that if you're born with male parts but you identify as a woman, you deserve the right to be yourself as much as anyone else. And I think that is a tolerant and progressive thing to do. And we should all have the freedom to be ourselves tolerant, and not have it forced onto us. Tolerant and progressive is completely accepting people for who they are without making them alter themselves surgically or physically in any way, just fully Those embracing Those people were born into the wrong are. body and deserve the right to be themselves. To be born into the wrong body and that is a myth. Well, I agree that, that people have identified as all these things. And the truth is, I don't accept that you can convince a kid that they are something other than they are. We talk about kids being confused by this. The truth is that if you're not a cis man or woman, mm. then you've been confused way, for hundreds listen, of years because I'm not a cis you're not man. reflected you in the education me a cis system. Man. Yeah, the, so this is a young white entitled student basically claiming to be black, that's his self ID. Not okay. Now, Kathleen Stock, the feminist philosopher and colleague of yourself, she recently pointed out that the UCU, the University and yep. Colleges Union, yep. allows people to self ID as a woman, as black, black and as disabled. disabled. It's up to you. Now, other people have attacked her for pointing this out and said that within critical disability theory, it's perfectly normal for people to decide if then they're, you know, it's up to you to know if you're disabled or not, it's not up to somebody else. And similarly, I suppose you can make the argument because this category of being a person of colour, yeah, uh, I think would they, you know, say, or BAME has become another acceptable acronym. It's hard to, I mean, there's no, where is the boundary? I mean, we're all ultimately Africans, you know, we've all got some African heritage. So there isn't, unlike biological sex, which has got a very sharp dividing line, race, race, is, race is more socially constructed yeah. than sex. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, 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 and the boundaries, obviously, because there is mixed race people, mm. for one thing, race, to some extent, is more like, is more like gender, right? So, there is... It's the, a constructed level there of There's something. a constructed yeah. level related to race, and it also involves a lots of social values and stereotypes and all kinds of mm. issues. Right. Then there is, I don't know what we could call it, I think some people call it ethnicity. Okay. To refer to like the material, material the, layer, the, the materiality DNA, yeah. aspect, <clears throat> skin colour, hair, these kinds of things, um, aspects to do with body shape, whatever else. Mm. Various different morphological features that vary between different ethnic yeah. groups, let's say. Okay. So there is a level of materiality there. Um, race. I would say is actually the analogue of gender, mm. right? Um, in so far as yes, it 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 also creates cl clearer lines between things. The 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 ethnic differences between humans are much more variable, mm. and there's much more. It's actually much more spectrum-like. Yeah, yeah. Than biological differences. Which is not spectrum-like at all. I mean, it's really, yeah. really, really, yeah. really, really, really unspectrum-like. And, and the <laughs> prosecution lawyer in the Maya Forstater case, who led just to kind of I remind you. amazing. So the prosecution lawyer is is arguing on behalf of her former employers that they had every right to um, not renew her contract, effectively fire her, because uh, her, her views are not acceptable and are, but not only are they not acceptable, they're not protected beliefs, because in Britain, you can hold religious beliefs. For example, you, you could be a Mormon and work for that think tank, and they can't fire you because you believe in some... No, that would be religious discrimination. Yeah, you know, even though Mormon beliefs to many people are quite ridiculous, no, or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever, I'm not trying to attack anybody, but just that there are beliefs which most of us would go, no, sorry. But you can't get fired for having those beliefs because they're protected. Whereas Maya Forstater's belief in the immutability, effectively the immutability of biological sex, she's effectively arguing that if you're born male, that's just the thing. You can't. You can modify your body and your behaviour and everything, your appearance, but you're you're immutably biologically male. That claim was then attacked as incoherent, irrational, and a conspiracy theory by the prosecution lawyer, who argued, uh, and also that she was undermining human dignity because, as this this lawyer claimed, 
sex is a spectrum. Well, they, that, that was the reason why they said that it was incoherent. Yeah. They said that um, it, it couldn't be regarded as like a as like a serious and coherent set of views because this is it the, required, the idea that, that male and female are real. You, it's a very strange way that they framed it. It required you to suspend disbelief mm. in the fact that sex is a spectrum. And yeah. we're like, but sex isn't a spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> but it keeps... And the other thing that it, that it required you to suspend disbelief in was that, that was the, the GRA could change your sex. Right, okay, so in, in <laughs> the UK, we since 2000 and what is it, 2004? 2004. 2004. There's been a, a law called the Gender Recognition Act which allows you to change your legal sex. Now, for most of us, this is quite a clear distinction. There's biological sex, there's a, the sort of physical ground level reality we're in. And then there's the legal sex, which is a sort of legal marker, which for most, in most purposes, would, in most cases, would just match your biological sex. But for seemingly, for the you know, reasons of trying to integrate Transsexuals, which is a word which is now becoming un unacceptable, but what would have been known as transsexual medicalizing. Yeah, um, we're supposed to not medicalize uh, the particular set of issues around what's now known as transgenderism. But the word transgender is a very recent word that I only heard for the first time in the last, I think, seven or eight years. And before that, there were transsexuals and there were transvestites. They were very different. The transsexuals were believed. There was. To, there used to be yeah. drag queens. Yeah transsexuals, transvestites, and then I think they all, they also used to be cross-dressing and I'm not sure if there was a meaningful distinction between transvesticism well, I, and cross-dressing. I, I mean the word transvestite literally means cross-dressing. Like you'd, you'd hear the words get used in slightly into, different into, in, sets. sets they, they, they have a slightly different shade of meaning I yeah, think, yeah. but more or less the same thing. So those were the things that we used to have and we used to clearly understand that those were different yeah. social phenomena. And now the words transsexual and transvestite have both been flagged up as outdated and kind of offensive like it's sort of like i suppose the word negro became into the 1970s and 80s in the united states before it was seen as a simply a descriptive marker and then it became like you, know, you don't say that um it's it's not it's not overtly a slur but it's not appropriate and in that way kids at school are getting told that you can't use the word transvestite the transsexual is an old-fashioned word the word is transgender it kind of blurs the distinction between a whole lot very, of different it's people. Very, it's very, very important. The, mm. the, the blurring of the distinction between transvestites and um, transsexuals mm. is a very important Absolutely. Uh, thing in terms of what is going on with this particular conflict. Yeah. Because essentially we're now being told that transvesticism doesn't exist and that there's no meaningful difference between transvestites and transsexuals and that transvestites are ontologically women. The opposite sex, yeah. The design, they are actually ontologically the, yeah, women. The design Nobody wear... before in the history of the world has ever suggested that transvestites were ontologically women. And also one of the things that's very complicated is that we're being told that we're not allowed to talk about the fact that there is any sexual motive um, for some males, so for some males to want to wear yeah. and present as female. We have known throughout human history mm. that some men dress as women and that there is a sexual reason for them to yeah. do so. This is not but now we're not allowed, allowed to say that. Now no, we're not allowed to say that and we're not allowed to even yeah. understand that we have always understood this to be true. Yeah. It's cons now it's a hateful conspiracy <laughs> theory based on, on sort of pseudoscience or something. It's being shot down all the time. But I mean you can find if you could be bothered, you can go on all kinds of online Reddit forums or whatever, full of, you know, male male bodied <laughs> men who, who like um to dress up in, in what? Which is fine. Yeah. yeah. And, and, Which they, is fine. and they openly talk about the fact that this is a sexual fetish. That's their thing. And that's okay. That and I don't have a problem I don't yeah. have a problem with that. Yeah. What I have a problem with is a political movement coming along, blurring the distinction between people who have transitioned who are transsexual mm. and transvestites, telling me that people who want to dress as women for sexual reasons are ontologically women yeah. and then telling me that I have to allow them to politically represent me. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is all going on in the UK. And so the Gender Recognition Act, initially, you could see it as a sort of a progressive act of legal compassion to help integrate transsexuals' lives. It was to let them get married. 
Right, okay. The main function of the Gender Recognition Act. Yeah. So it meant you could change your practically change your birth certificate. Well, no, because because um, male to female transsexuals who had who had fully transitioned and were in partnerships with men and wanted to be able to get married mm. couldn't get married. Oh, because this was before same sex marriage right. was allowed. Right. Yeah. So this is a very important thing, and there's a there's a there's a there are questions around the way in which the GRA is formulated for various reasons because the, the use of the, the sex and gender terminology in the GRA is a complete mess. But, the, but fundamentally, I think it was in the late, in the late 90s or early noughties, uh, a transsexual woman called Goodwin, I believe, took the United Kingdom to the European Court of Human Rights because they, because she couldn't get married. Right. Because her birth certificate still had her. She was all her. Legal and it was before. It was before there was gay marriage. Yeah. So her birth certificate still said that she was male. So she wasn't allowed to legally marry. And she said that it interfered with her human right to privacy and mm. and family and family life, which is, was quite reasonable. And the judgment that was made by the European Court, which was very interesting, which said. They agreed, they upheld her case, and they said it was interfering with her right to privacy and family life. And um, the claim that they made was, given that the state had invested resources in, allow in supporting her to make a transition, okay. it was then unfair for them to withhold okay, the legal Okay, because the right. NHS had supported her. She'd position, had a, she'd yeah. had a fully she'd had a fully I think um, yeah funded state funded state funded transition. Okay, and they said it didn't make any sense for a state to be willing to support somebody to transition, and then to refuse them legal recognition that would allow that transition to translate into them living a fully functional life. Right. Yeah. Um, which I think is fine. That seems like that a actually very that seems good fair. That argument, seems fair. Yeah. yeah. Right. So what that then so one of the one of the questions around the GRA is that essentially there were two ways that that that, that problem could have been solved passing gay marriage mm -hmm. or the gender recognition act and actually one of the ways of interpreting the GRA is that is that they wanted they didn't they didn't want to pass gay marriage ah okay so arguably there is something fundamentally homophobic yeah. <laughs> underpinning the, the the decision to to construct the GRA. When, when was when was gay marriage allowed in this country? I don't it's, know. It was quite recent. Yeah, it was only about like, four or five years yeah, ago. I can't yeah. remember exactly. Yeah, no, so it's it quite a bit before, longer. Yeah. So so the GRA as it st as it stands, allows... which is actually not irrelevant to to why the gay rights movement has effectively been taken over by the trans rights right, movement. Right, because it's because achieved they, they, everything, yeah. They'd finished their legislative slate. That yeah. was the end of their legislative yeah. slate. Stonewall effectively should have should have, you know, hung 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 up its hung up its spurs. Yeah. And gone, we've done our job. Yeah. Stonewall's the main uh, gay was was the main gay gay and lesbian rights organisation in the UK. Once upon a time, yeah, and, it represented homosexuals. Yeah, and it, it achieved everything. It, it you know got full rights for gay and lesbians in the UK. Uh, but like a lot of these full, organisations, full legal, it, full legal rights. Yeah. it basically fully achieved its legislative state. Uh, so, it did, and it did an amazing job. And in that process, it accrued a massive quantity of social capital, yeah. which it has now pissed up the wall. I think is yeah. the technical term. I mean, there was a lot of funding available um, for trans. Campaigning, Stonewall took on the transgender thing in a really big way, and then has become a very bizarre organisation which now denies um, denies the reality denies of the homosexuality. Exist denies the existence of homosexuality. Yeah, so they, they define um, gay and lesbian relationships in terms of gender identity, which is a this ineffable, almost metaphysical kind of essence which we are all supposed to have. So. Um, yeah, so Stonewall have, have, have rather lost the plot and there's been a breakaway uh, movement in since we last spoke, and quite recently in fact, the LGB Alliance. About had, a month ago, I think. Yeah, yeah uh, so Simon Fanshawe, who was one of the founders of, of Stonewall, was very upset with the way lesbians in particular were being treated um, because they were being told that you know a fully male-bodied person uh, can be a lesbian and should be accepted as such in all of their spaces and organisations and so on. Um, and there was a lot of abuse towards lesbians and a complete disinterest in their in their well-being, as far as I could see. So Simon Fanshawe spoke out, and a few other people spoke out, and then 
the LGBT, LGBT alliance broke away, was immediately attacked for being transphobic, even though they're just simply stating that they want to defend same-sex attraction, whereas the organisation that they broke away from was no longer prepared to do that. Um, but they've been entirely... It's, it's, whole... it's, it's classic. What's happened between Stonewall and the LGB Alliance is a classic performance of <clears throat> what we would say is kind of coercive control, mm. effectively. Um, Stonewall... Um, adopted an ideology which denies the existence of biological sex and therefore cannot recognise the existence of homosexuality as same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. A large number of homosexuals um, are unhappy with that situation and so they decided to leave because Stonewall would not represent their political beliefs or interests as they saw them and then Stonewall has essentially responded by calling us names and trying to demonise us and it's kind of interestingly representative of the coercive kind of mechanisms because as lots of people have noted it it mirrors what's happened what happens in domestic violence mm. like you try and you try and leave <laughs> and then you're vilified and demonised and called names and you get a lot of aggression because because you're not allowed to leave. Yeah. So effectively what it demonstrates is that we were kind of um, being held there against our will. Mm. Um, so I think that's quite interesting in terms of the way in which it exemplifies certain kind, certain aspects of the of the political dynamics that are at play. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't really be a clearer illustration. Um, it's, um, but it's Stonewall, Stonewall's main mission now, I think, since um, yeah, since since the gay marriage laws, has been uh, amending the GRA. So the GRA reform has, has been the, the top of the agenda, and the idea is um, to streamline, as they call it, and demedicalise the issue. So rather than in the, as the law is currently framed, someone has to be diagnosed by a doctor or panel of doctors as uh, to having gender dysphoria, genuine psychological distress at there, or well, it should be sex dysphoria, really. It should be sex dysphoria. Yeah, so, so you're, you just can't, you know, you cannot face the fact that you're in the in the, the sexed body you are. People, it's, it's a pretty rare condition, um, and people with it in the past have suffered greatly, and some of them have undergone transsexual uh, transition. But in any case, uh, there, there's been a sort of gatekeeping process to make sure that that isn't abused, as you kind of have to build into any law really and the idea now is to just dismantle that self-identification is the new idea where anyone can simply claim without any oversight whatsoever um, to be the opposite sex and have all their legal paperwork changed and have access to all of the spaces and services and everything that go with that and they're pushing this really hard and anyone that's spoken out against it is being attacked as particularly women have been attacked as bigots um, and I think it's in that that's the frame, that's the context in which Maya Forstater spoke out. I think she's one of the women who were like, wait a minute. It was, it was, dur it was during the consultation process. Yeah, so there's been so, a GRA so, so there was a consultation process which ran from uh, kind of the spring, early summer of last year and, until October of last year. Yeah. Um, there was a public consultation and then there were forms that we all had to fill out and send in. And the public consultation <laughs> only happened because a bunch of feminists kicked off and... and no, I'm not sure well, about that. that happened anyway? I th yes, no, I would have to okay. check. I would have to check on right. that. I think there was a public consultation built into it. Okay. No feminist groups were consulted during the uh, initial trans inquiry, which was conducted prior to the consultation. Um, the consultation lasted, yeah, until October. During the course of the consultation process, the debate around this became um, extremely heated um, uh, but it but it it was conducted largely in the wings of the public of the public sphere yeah, most because, people were unaware this was because going on. because yeah. the media there has been a a, a very um, what's, the, what's the best way of saying it a very effective um, campaign of kind of institutional capture mm. essentially so um, advocates of the trans rights position have uh, managed to um, place themselves in 
positions of significant authority and there is also because there is a very vocal uh, active particularly among young people uh, active political movement that supports the trans rights agenda and also engages in quite extreme effort to close down and silence anybody that uh, is resisting that particular political program um, has meant that uh, the mainstream media, by and large, some of the right-wing media started to cover this during the GRA consultation, but largely through pressure that was created by feminist groups. Yeah. And, but it was, you know, the BBC, mainstream media in that respect, and the left-wing press have remained more or less silent on the issue. Yeah. That is now changing, but literally it started changing. With respect to the BBC, for example, it's only started changing in the last few weeks. Mm. There have been a few instances over the last few weeks, uh, on today, yesterday, or the day before, on the Andrew Marr show this morning, questions were actually asked to MPs with respect to this issue because because the Labour Party put a commitment to uphold women's right. existing okay. rights. Yeah, this is rights. another important thing going on right now. Is so again, if you're not in Britain, you might not be aware, but we're facing another general election ah. in December. And it's probably, it's one of the more pivotal general elections in recent British history, mainly because of the Brexit thing. So there's a lot of confusion around, a lot of, lot of different issues flying around. That's the big one most people are talking about. But the Labour Party trying, well, different factions within the Labour Party, as far as Jane can figure this out, have resulted in a self-contradictory, or seemingly self-contradictory party manifesto. So on one hand, you have the manifesto claims that, that the party will work to make sure that women's legal rights to say same-sex spaces as outlined in the Equalities Act. There's a legal right that female citizens have to their own, they can have their own spaces, their own services. That being female is a protected characteristic as is being um, disabled, being gay. Having undergone religious, religious, belief religious beliefs, and gender, reassignment. gender reassignment as as supervised in terms of the GRA. <coughs> so there are these protected char characteristics. One of them is being female, and so women have the right to their own female people have the right to their own thing. Um, I think male people actually also have rights. Right. Yeah. Can in, men in, only in, so, in some respects yeah. to certain kinds of single sex provision? If it's yeah. if it's, but I mean, obviously, it is of more concern. Uh, with respect to Be providing because specific of the places with women. endless looming spectre of sexual violence. So the, the one the, the situations which most readily come to mind are prisons, uh, shelters and crisis centres for vulnerable women, rape crisis centres, this kind of thing, right. um, sleeping quarters for you know girl guides, and like reasons places where up until quite recently people would have said yes, that's a very sensible idea to se segregate uh, on the basis of biological sex. So that's all been upheld, that's all held in place by British law because of the Equalities Act and women have been worrying, feminists have been worrying that that was going to be eroded with changes to the GRC. The Labour Party have... It's not only that. Right. So, I mean, this is a complicated situation and there's, there's two things going on. Mm. One is the question of the interaction between the GRA and the, and the, equality, and the exemptions in the Equalities Act. Right. Because... If you have a GRC, then you become legally female. That's a gender recognition so certificate. So if, if you have a gender yeah. recognition certificate, which is what the GRA provided yeah. for the legal creation and, of. And that right? allows you to change your legal sex. That change, yeah. you, you get your birth certificate reissued and then you can change your legal sex. Um, <clears throat> and that allows you to you know, get married and do various things in that sex. So then there is a question if there are certain people who have a legal sex of being female whether they have rights to access services for female people. Yeah. The provision that is made in the Equalities Act is that um, female people are lawfully allowed to exclude um, people who are legally female but biologically male mm -hmm. <clears throat> if that exclusion is, the phrase is, proportionate to a legitimate aim. Okay, so, so say a women's <coughs> knitting circle, maybe not, but a women's changing room, probably well, yes. Well, yes, I mean, it, it, and, and and there is a degree of um, 
unclarity around exactly what where does that mean? What's proportional? exactly yeah, what's yeah. proportionate and what's legitimate. So the examples that are given in the notes of the Equalities Act use examples of uh, around rape crisis centres because those seem to be the most obvious, yeah. right? So there's, I mean, and they and they apply to various different areas like occupational requirements and and spaces and various things. So one of the examples, for example, in the restrictions around occupational requirements is that it would be lawful, for example, for a rape crisis centre to stipulate that its counsellors who were dealing with female people who'd experienced sexual violence were biologically female. Yeah. And that's considered to be proportionate to a legitimate... So rate. as the law stands in Britain, that is the case, even though there are, <coughs> I think, Stonewall and various people are right, issuing... So, so, so this, is, this is what has been... What, what is complicated, mm. right, is that Stonewall and various trans rights organisations have been going around doing training in major public institutions yeah. in which they have been telling our public institutions that that is not the case, that female people do not have the right to single sex spaces and that it is unlawful and discriminate is unlawful discrimination yeah. to exclude not only trans women with a GRC, anyone but, identifies but anyone as, yeah. that identifies yeah. as a woman. So this is blatantly a misreading of the law, and yet the public perception is Stonewall is this heroic organisation that's exactly. been standing up for oppressed minorities, right, exactly. and, so, and they're the experts, they're the people we should go to. If we want to talk about our inclusivity policy, we right. ought to go to Stonewall. And they also give a stamp. You get like a special Stonewall seal of approval, approval. stamp. Okay, right. right, so there's also... You know, and, and as we've witnessed, I mean, there's something very strange that's going on in terms of the relationship between um, corporate capitalism and its desire to appropriate the, the social credibility of the gay rights movement. Mm. So, um, I mean, we call it rainbow washing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. And, and, I mean, if you walk down Brighton High Street before mm. Pride, mm. like sort of you know early in the summer the entire high street everyone's got the rainbows out everyone's yeah. got their rainbows it's out it's it, it it's now we're now in this state that it's like simply just a way of <clears throat> capitalist organization like virtue signaling yeah. their did, woke credentials did you see the budweiser all those budweiser adverts they have those different colored plastic drinking cups for pride and all the different they have the right. pansexual flag and the right Exa exactly and the thing i think that's really important to note about this i think it's a it's a, a, a general point to make about the way in which queer politics is functioning in relation to this thing that we kind of want to talk about which is like m materiality and the importance of materiality in terms of like class what the left used to understand as class politics, mm. it costs a bank nothing to put a rainbow, put a rainbow in its yeah, window, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? It costs Facebook nothing to put like 37, 64 or however many it was like genders in its drop down menu, mm. right? You don't have to do anything to challenge the fundamental system of material exploitation that is, that is, that is underpinning our social structure and you don't you don't you don't have to make sure that your products are ethically sourced you don't have to pay your uh staff better you don't have to pay better pensions yeah. you don't have to increase weight you know none of these there things. are no painful difficult there's no decisions. painful difficult uh, decisions just... don't do anything that affects your bottom line you just put some rainbows in the window <laughs> um and so so there's that going on. So there's a kind of generic rainbow washing and kind of commodification of the identity of the gay rights movement in the way in which that's playing out in, in relation to, to like corporate culture. Mm. And then there is also the fact that public institutions, I think there's also a lot of guilt going on a, around about how long it took the gay rights movement to achieve its objective. Yeah, because you can look back into recent history and see even like, you just think back to the Thatcher times. Yeah, because it, Clause 28, I mean, yeah. that's when Stonewall was founded, yeah. right? So, yeah. so, so it took them 30 years of extremely hard campaigning mm. to, to, to achieve their legislative slate from starting from the Section 28 moment, essentially. Yeah, Section 28 was, uh, or Clause 28, it was... It was um, yeah, it was, it was a law. Well, it became a set. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was a it was a, a legislative move by the Conservative government under Margaret Thatcher to stop 
I think was it stops schools from um, Pros it was like proselytizing or positive images. It was about they had, they had the phrase positive images, providing positive images of homosexuality. So to show any kind of you know non heteronormative domestic situation in a, in a school type right. learning situation would be seen as, as, as illegal. And of course that was um, you know that caused great consternation and, and the gay rights movement kind of was. Uh, Galvanised around fighting that in this country, and then yeah, so Stonewall. Um, Stonewall was founded in opposition to yeah, to Claude and, and and it fought Stonewall. hard, and it achieved everything. It, it, it as we said, everything it set out to achieve um, legally, um, but then the funding streams shifted it towards this strange new ideology of denying um, human sex as a actual reality. Right, um, and we so and then so then we have this struggle around the change to the Gender Recognition Act in this country, people like Maya Forstadt are speaking out and and then we start to see women being attacked physically, verbally threatened and in her case losing her job. Um, yeah, I mean the first the first physical attack on a, on a feminist was um, the attack on Maria McLachlan. Yeah that's what I that was the first time I saw something like this. Maria McLachlan in Hyde Park going with a group of women to a meeting uh, about the GRA, simply going to discuss their rights and changes to the law. Right. And she was attacked, unprovoked. She was she was filming a group of angry protesters who were screaming at, at her and her friends, and uh, was attacked by a very tall, male-bodied transvestite. I'm, I, I will call him. I don't care. Sorry. <laughs> he beat up an old lady. Tara, Tara Wolf. Tara Wolf. And the judge in the, finally went to, to trial. Class war anarchists outside protesting in favour of this. Young of, man of, the right for, a, of the right for men to hit old yeah, women. Yeah, that was that was really quite alarming. But then it's been pointed out class war has always been misogynistic. But um, <clears throat> well, I mean, this is one of the. I mean, there are so many things in the political mix of what's going on here, mm. and one of the one of the things that's going on is that the left has always had a very serious misogyny problem. I mean, mm. radical feminism as a political movement was born in the crucible of reaction to, to, to the misogyny of the left, right? right. Like, um, the women who were central to, like, the, the, you know, the early radical feminist groups that were the, the core, you know, New York, um, New York radical women, the, those types of organisations that were set up in the late 60s and early 70s, they were women who had come out of the new left. And they had been organising in the New Left for most of the 60s. Um, they were involved in the civil rights movement, they were involved in the anti-Vietnam war protests as part of the New Left. And they became increasingly uh, dissatisfied with the way in which they were marginalised and treated as secretaries and just expected to make the food. And they, you know, there's a very famous quote from What's his name? Stokey Carmichael, mm. um, and he was he was he was talking about one of the students' organisations, but he basically said the the only the only role for a woman in this organisation is prone, and those women who were involved in that organising basically started to meet in small groups and started discussing their experiences, and that was the genesis of radical feminism. Okay, and this is kind of why radical <laughs> feminism's got this difficult relationship with the left still and then you see it now like with the, the the only newspapers reporting things like the attack on Maria McLachlan would be the right-wing tabloids right. Right. And, and kind of stirring it up in a kind of bigoted and and, and quite ignorant sort of way and, and appealing to people's worst instincts but they're the only ones talking about it the only places a lot of radical feminists are getting any airtime is in the right-wing media which, which is, is which is which is kind of ironic because yeah. radical feminism is fundamentally part of the left yeah right in order, in order to have a coherent analysis of the oppression of women, you have to understand how it intersects with capitalism, and you have to have to understand how it intersects with race, and uh, with class, and with these other issues, right? So, I, I am very firmly of the belief that radical feminism that is not of the left is fundamentally incoherent. Mm. However, because the left is actually no less misogynist than the right, right? I mean, Andrea Dawkins very famously said that the only difference between right-wing and left-wing misogynists is that right-wing misogynists want women to belong to an, want every woman to belong to an individual man, and left-wing misogynists want women to belong to men as a collective. <laughs> they want us to be public property. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but um, the, I mean, the, you, you see this in the sex work is work stuff on like how vocal left wing men are about that, um, about how you know. All oh the, right, this all, yeah, all promoting the stuff, prostitution, all the, all the, all the, all the yeah, stuff about yeah. kink, all the stuff about like. It is no surprise that left wing men would have found um, so much that they found amenable mm. in trans ideology, right? That's that's not that's not strange. Radical feminism has always had a very difficult relationship with the wider with the wider left mm. because um, the yeah. men of the left they want to undo the exploitative nature of class-based relations, but they have no interest in general in examining the relationship between those class-based relationships and their exploitative relationships with women. Mm. So women within a, like a, the framework of political left activism have the extra job of trying to dismantle the patriarchal stuff that's going on inside their movement on top of doing what the movement's trying to do, which is dismantle class-based oppression. Right, I mean, I would, I would argue, I mean, that you... I mean, I'm both a socialist and a radical feminist. I mean, it's slightly, it's slightly complicated, but I think when you understand them properly, they, they're not contradictory. Mm. Uh, you can't get rid of, of class-based exploitation if you leave sex-based exploitation in place. Mm. They're, 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 yeah. they're so utterly threaded yeah, well, through each other. Yeah, but socialist feminists have been saying this for decades, and, and right. yeah, it, it's not, it hasn't quite got through yet. To... Yeah, except socialist feminists sometimes argue that if you get rid of class, it will that undo. In itself it, that will, in okay. itself will right. undo. So there are different flavours of socialist feminism. It depends. The difference between socialist feminism and radical feminism is principally whether you, the, the priority. Whether mm. you think that the oppression of women is a product of, of of capitalist class-based relations or whether you think uh, sex-based domination happens first and then economic relations uh, Okay, functional, so we uh, need to sort that out top. first and then the other problem will go away. So it's like, so exactly, so, so, the, so from a radical feminist perspective, some of the issues that have been problematic is that socialist feminists tend to argue that we need to ally with men and deal with the class-based issues first, mm. because then if we deal with the class-based issues, then somehow sex-based oppression will just magically disappear, which is clearly nonsense. Mm. Um, which is not to say, you know, I'm not a socialist. No, <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, there, there are subtle ways these two points of view can interweave, no doubt. Um, but yeah, the situation we see in Britain at the moment, uh, the young, particularly the young progressive inheritors of what we would have called the left, um, yeah, it's quite strange to see them supporting, you know, pornography and prostitution and, you know, the erosion of women's rights um, as well, progressive. Well, someone said on Twitter yesterday, the men of the left really dislike the free market apart from when it's in women's flesh. <laughs> yeah. And then suddenly, apparently, commodification is a great thing. It's empowering and yeah. Commodification is suddenly empowering. It's it's really troubling to watch all of this happening. So yeah, so my um, Maria McLaughlin went to court with a bunch of, you know, supposedly radical lefties outside supporting the man that beat the young man that beat her up. And the judge refused to um, or kept forcing her to or correcting her for using the wrong pronouns, yeah. for refusing to call the man that attacked her she. And in the end, didn't award her damages because she did. Yeah, or I think he, I think he did award her damages, not, but, he, not much. but he subtracted he subtracted some amount yeah. from her damages because she'd missed. She she refused to, to yeah. Um, and th this this the young attacker got a very small fine, which I, as far as I'm aware, he just crowdfunded from all his admirers, um, and is, is still out doing his thing. But um, anyway, so there's been physical attacks. That that's the most most. Um, the high Julie, someone, someone, someone tried to attack Julie Bindo yeah. in Somebody in who's, who Boston. nicked Kathy Newman's name as well. Not Kathy Newman. Was it, was Kath it? No, no, no Kathy Brennan. Kathy Brennan, sorry. Who's Kathy Newman? Kathy Newman is a Channel 4 oh, journalist. Sorry. <laughs> the, one who, the one who had the famous car crash oh. with Jordan Peterson. Oh, yes, that's it. That's what I've seen the name about. Um, yeah, a, a, a metaphorical car crash. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, Kathy Newman's an American radical feminist, and this man basically bearded man who calls himself Kathy uh, Brennan. Kathy Brennan. Just for whatever bizarre psychological reason. Um, basically hurled just himself... appropriated appropriated her name. name. Yeah, and then, so then we came out on, you know, in social media the next day, Kathy Brennan attacks... <laughs> <laughs> <Jenny>. <laughs> yeah. So Julie Bindle had been 
you know, Julie Bindle's done this amazing work for women in prisons and, you know, domestic violence. She's a real, you know... She also gets, she also does a lot of work on sexual violence abroad. She mm. does a lot of work um, supporting lesbians mm. um, in the Global South. She's Julie Bindle has lived one of the most exemplary, committed, like, women-centred mm. lives you could ever imagine. Yeah, and then you get some brat <laughs> on Twitter going, oh, the only reason you're complaining about trans women in, in women's prisons is because you hate trans people. You never cared about women in prison before. And it's that was like, Ash Sakar. Really? Yeah, wow. that was that was Ash Sakar. Wow. Ash Sakar, I think, did a, like a two minute Google search on Twitter yeah. and then concluded that Julie Bindle didn't care about women in prison. Just was despite, using the fact, despite the fact that Julie Bindle is one of the founders of, of um, what's it called? Release? Or, no, it's um, women, in, women, women in Justice is the, the organisation yeah. that she runs with Harriet Wistridge, yeah. where they specifically campaign to help women, particularly women who have um, been convicted of murdering abusive partners. Oh, right. Okay. I mean, she's, yeah, she's pretty frontline and she definitely, you, I mean, to accuse Julie Bindle of never having cared about women in prison is just a it's complete completely absurd. lack of historical <laughs> awareness. But in any case, this tall, bearded man, uh, Kathy Bre uh, Brennan, launched himself at her as she was leaving a meeting where she'd been discussing her work, uh, not spreading hatred or attacking anybody. Um, and it was only because there was a you know, police or security there restraining him that she didn't get pretty badly hurt, we, as far as we can tell. Yeah. Um, so, and then, of course, there's all the death threats and rape threats that are just, just normal now. I mean, women, any woman who speaks out now is just receiving this stuff in, in huge amounts. It's really alarming. Um, yeah, and, and the... <clears throat> Oh, there was one yesterday, some like bearded dude turned up on Twitter and was like, fuck turfs! And he got like one and a half thousand likes and then like a whole thread underneath being like, yeah, and we love you! And like, heart, 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 heart. Yeah, it's, it's really easy. And like, easy, this, guy, this, this guy is just like, I don't know, some like game gamer guy. Like, there's a there's a quite an interesting intersection between like what was going on in Gamergate and yeah. a lot of the people on the internet who are supporting the trans rights movement. Um, so Gamergate was a controversy around a female computer game reviewer, I believe, yep. who uh, was accused of some kind of indiscretion in terms of reviewing her boyfriend's game or something like that. Something that would have been a very minor accusation in a, in a fairly irrelevant sphere, but blew up into this massive outpouring of misogyny on the internet. Basically all of these just, you know, psychologically <laughs> twisted male computer game nerds decided to unleash all of their misogyny at this woman. Um, and so Gamergate, you can read about that, it's this whole thing. And that, some, of, some of that has more. It's sort of, yeah, it seems some to be of, Some of that has away. kind of bled into some of the mechanisms that are going on. Because you can be, appear to be a, supporting a vulnerable minority and get lots of likes and, and thumbs ups and hearts and things if you attack TERFs. As Jane said, TERFs, again, you might not. That's T E R F, it's a horrible slur now. It supposedly started as well. It started as an acronym for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminists, uh, but now it's just used, it's just thrown around like slut or something like that's just a horrible word it means it means it means it means bitch yeah it's just like woman who won't comply to it means what? it means non-compliant woman yeah. you fucking bitch um and <laughs> if, if you don't believe this you just have to look at the website turf is a slur dot com and there are just thousands and thousands of screenshots of it being used in that way now people go oh but it's just a description well it has been pointed out that you know words like idiot imbecile spastic you know these were all moron th these were all descriptive scientific words at one point and uh, you know at some point a word gets so tied up with abusive use that it, it is abandoned as a descriptor but in any case you know simply by saying fuck turfs you can get you know a huge amount of social credit in a in a certain scene yeah um including from a lot of women which is young women i'm you know i i i, I find it very troubling to watch this but um that's a, that's an interesting issue in itself. Yeah. So effectively, by creating this category of turf, uh, you've demonised this group of women. And so Maya Forstater, um, Maria McLachlan, the fact that they have nuanced insights into what's going on in the world, they have something to say that they've never hurt anybody or caused any, you know, or or, or advocated anybody got hurt. Just the fact that they are a turf is enough. That they deserve to be beaten. I mean, you see this all the time. Turfs. I have no sympathy for turfs. Turfs should be, you know, kill them, beat them up, whatever. Um, there's also they deserve very, violence. There's also, there's also a very noticeable trend, which I think is 
worth pointing to mm. of using um, phrases which essentially present turfs as <clears throat> vermin. So, so oh, yeah. um, we've, been, we've been called infestations, we've been referred to as cockroaches, um, there's a there's a like very often you'll get you'll get you'll get something like hive of turf yeah yeah swarm, swarm of yeah turfs. yeah so you're just yeah basically um, and I find it very I find it very notable that we have uh, a situation in which we have um, large portions of the purported left many of whom um, style themselves in a in a kind of antifa esque way as either being anti fascist organisations or uh, anarchist organisations. So large numbers of the of the groups that were picketing the uh, the Brighton meeting, where there was like a very intense kind of standoff. This was the Women's Place UK organisation meeting in Brighton during a Labour conference to discuss these matters. And... Where we were surrounded by about a hundred people screaming scum and mm. shame on you and all of this stuff. Lots but a of lot... black masks and. Um, there weren't so many black masks, but there was, I mean, uh, the only thing that it can be compared to, and, and the same thing happened uh, in Toronto when Megan Murphy gave her talk in the, in the public library there, um, the only comparable type of protest is the type of thing you see outside abortion clinics. Right, yeah. It was, it's, it's like that level of like intense vitriol screaming where you literally have to run a gauntlet, you have to walk through. They had, there was a very, very narrow space mm. that we had to walk through with people, with a large crowd screaming, shame on you, shame on you, scum, scum, that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> unfortunately the building that we were in was kind of on a corner and the the room that we were meeting in had windows that were street level um, and they surrounded the building and they kicked the windows that we were of the meeting room like just repeatedly for like two hours so the meeting was just just punctuated and by the and just banging and well i mean it was just incredibly difficult for us mm. to meet because you could feel the aggressive energy coming right, through yeah, yeah. coming into the room and everyone had had to walk through this gauntlet there were there were women in there who were survivors of, of domestic and sexual violence having panic attacks luckily because we're the women's movement we had a lot of women in yeah. there who work with women yeah. in those contexts but there was women having to like counsel other women who were hyperventilating but and just trying to have a meeting inside yeah. it was yeah. absolutely horrible mm. it was completely horrible to get out the police had to like cordon the crowd back over one side so we and we could only get out one way and like we had to scurry down this little alleyway as if the police hadn't been there what the policing was i mean, I mean yeah the police the police, the police, the police, the police the police when they were banging the windows the police were just standing there just being like oh, it's a peaceful protest, there's nothing we can do. And I was like, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure if I went and like repeatedly kicked the window of HSBC, mm. you would come along and arrest me pretty fast for disturbing the peace. Yeah. Um, so... But you're saying a lot of the people in the protest... But a lot were... of the people organising that were purportedly anti-fascist organisations. Yeah. And I find it incredibly... Well, they've decided you're the new fascists, really. Well, they've decided that we're the new fascists but it's very notable that they, that, that the reason why we are being demonised, right, mm. is because apparently we are guilty of <clears throat> these horrible acts of uttering and exclusion. But what is very noticeable is that the structure of trans rights discourse is based so centrally on the demonization of the figure of the turf mm. and on this us and them structure that's created by that and is using precisely the type of like dehumanizing comparing you to vermin yeah they're, rhetoric they're, they're, they're sort of that, claiming you're that doing. is yeah. that is fundamentally fascist mm. right yeah. like 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 our claim is that female people exist and that they have particular political rights as female people we're not claiming that trans people should not be recognised in law. We're not claiming that they shouldn't be legally protected from discrimination. We're claiming there's a rights conflict, mm. basically, between 
certain articulated demands of the trans rights movement and certain needs that female people have to female only spaces as an oppressed group who are subject yeah. to male violence mm. um, and you know as a as a fundamental mechanism of our oppression right it's not accidental you know and you get into lots of arguments with people on Twitter about these things and they'll be saying things like, oh, but like women can rape women and women are just as violent as men and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, so certain portions of third wave feminism have allied themselves with a political movement that fundamentally kind of pushes them into a corner where they have to deny that female people are oppressed as a class yeah. by male yeah. people and are subject to mechanisms of Be violence and discrimination. Because that's <laughs> turfy if you start saying things you, like that. Well, well saying that female people are oppressed on the basis of sex mm. is now turfy. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because, the, because they want you to believe that somehow, yes, women have been oppressed, but it's because of their femininity rather than their femaleness. Right, because of their femininity, because people are oppressed on the basis of gender. Yeah. It's, so, it's, so, so that essentially, which, which actually is the most horrific victim blaming bullshit ever, mm. right? So you are essentially claiming that female people who are subjected to male violence are subjected to that violence because they have identified yeah. into it in some sense and that essentially if we all just identify out of an of of this particular if we all identify not as women yeah. we will cease to be oppressed i mean it's completely yeah. absurd i mean this is a question these questions are never answered when when i see them posed on social media by feminists that when there's news stories about young girls being trafficked or infanticide or, infanticide. or, or right. female genital mutilation it's like can they identify out of that can they just go actually well, Sal I, I mean this is this is I mean one of the things that happened with Sally Hines so no, Sally Hines let's bring Sally Hines into yeah, this so Sally Hines is professor of gender studies at Leeds University she's professor of sociology and gender identity is it okay right and Something she about. just got some massive grant for some new research project and she tweets some really offensive nonsense um often it would appear she's intoxicated i mean she's really badly judged it's the only it's nasty the, it's, i mean it's the most charitable explanation yeah let's just say that uh, yeah anyway um so sally hines uh but i mean there was there was a, there was a, this thing that has happened mm. right is that every time sally hines tweets some kind of offensive nonsense about um you know how women essentially you know uh, women's oppression can be understood in terms of like identification with gender, right? People will post links mm. to things about female infanticide or female genital mutilation or think you know um, sex-based abortion or any of these things, mm. right? And then Sally's always like, "I don't understand why you keep posting these things," and we're like, <laughs> because. Because you keep making an absurd claim yeah. that women are not oppressed because they are female and we want you to explain to us how there are several hundreds of thousands, possibly up to a million, missing female people on the planet who, have, who are missing because they were either aborted or they were killed as infants mm -hmm. because they were female. Yeah. But she can't really face that. I get the feeling with Sally Hines is that she's she's trying to read Judith Butler, sort of thought she understood some of it, but isn't clever enough to sound... Um, was Judith Butler can just come out with stuff that you, you have to spend weeks trying to de deconstruct what she actually saying. What right. does this mean? Sally Hines just comes out with stuff that just sounds ridiculous. Like right. her claim that somebody made some reference to the female skeleton perhaps it, it may have been in a debate around sports um you know we're, we're seeing more and more male-bodied athletes admitted into women's sports so just a very quick example stonewall the organization we mentioned was brought in by the english the cricket board the cricket board i think of england england and wales the governing board for cricket they thought well we need to update our inclusion policy let's get stonewall they're the experts stonewall come in and go right we are the diversity champions yeah so you've got your men's cricket and your women's cricket and traditionally um i didn't know this but men's cricket is actually open to everyone but, but women well never... actually actually so, uh, someone was telling me about this as well yeah this is true of the nba in the states yeah right women the nba could play on the, women yeah. could play if, they in the NBA. if a woman came along it was better than all the other men then they, she, they could yeah, they strangely could. a woman has never played in yeah, the nba yeah. <laughs> whereas the women's teams have always been exclusively female um for reasons that 
ought to be obvious. Ought to be obvious. Um, and so cricket, the cricket um, board, the English cricket board's guidelines strictly had women's cricket, female only, you know, explained what they meant by that. And Stonewall went in, no, 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 that's got to be for women and trans women. Any, and that's, any, anyone who identifies as a woman can play on the women's cricket team. So that's, so as a result of that, Kent Cricket and Canterbury, where I'm based, uh, recently named their Woman of the Year, Woman, Woman Player of the Year, who is a six foot two, male bodied, hasn't done anything to, to alter his body, plays um, for the second men's second team for another county and uh, as a me fairly mediocre player uh, in that, at that level. Um, but, you know, uh, killing it. <laughs> killing it. With the women and uh, won an award. Anyway, that kind of thing upsets some people understandably and um, strangely us saying that upsets other people but um, these discussions about physical differences of male and female bodies are now sort of taboo and somebody mentioned the female skeleton I think in a context to do with athletic advantage and Sally Hines replied the female skeleton did not exist before the European Enlightenment <laughs> And, and so this led to lots of lots of laughter, some quite funny cartoons of sort of women-shaped blobs kind of sliding <laughs> around on the floor, pre-Descartes. Um, but again, it's like she sort of half understood something Judith Butler was trying to get across, and then... Oh, but this is also this is also a version of this is my favourite colonialism invented the gender binary. Oh yeah, it's a version of that. Yeah, there wasn't male and female until till we human, start human, Europeans. Human 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 sexual dimorphism was was invented by the European colonisation of Be the Americas. Because everywhere else we were everywhere the Europeans went, people were living in this sort of fluid, amorphous kind of. Yeah, I mean it's an ex in it's it's an extrapolation. I actually found the article that is. The, the series of articles yeah. that are the origin of the of the of the that um, claim of yeah. that claim, yeah. um, and it's quite interesting. I mean, talking about Judith Butler, um, because because they're based on like fairly decent ethnographic um, studies of the kinship structures yeah. of indigenous people prior to the pr prior to the colonization. Um, I think principally the Iroquois um, and they didn't live in patriarchal nuclear families, mm. right? They used to they used to have, um, I think, a matrilineal system, and several women would live together, and then the, their male dependents and children would all live together in kind of a large building. And in the course of the colonization of the Americas, the the indigenous population um, took on more uh, European kinship structures. Mm. Fine. That's what the ethnography shows. That seems quite reasonable. What that is, is the imposition of a patriarchal, of a Western patriarchal kinship structure on a different culture. Yeah, so a social framework being kind of imported. Or that's, that, that's, yeah, yeah. that's perfectly comprehensible. This article, basically what it does is it takes that ethnography and it literally sprinkles like four sentences of like magic Judith Butler dust okay. over it and suddenly it becomes colonialism, colonialism created human sexual dimorphism. Okay. Which is kind of amazing because the ethnographic studies, in order to describe the kinship structures that existed prior to colonization needed to need, need to yeah. use a word for male and yes. female in order to describe yeah. the kinship yeah. yeah. structure. See, I was under the but what they do is they take uh, uh, the original Indian phrases, the Iroquois phrases, yeah. <laughs> and then use those for male and female as oh, if that, that somehow demonstrates like somehow, it's yeah. somehow different. Yeah. Uh, that's it's also incredibly racist. Yes, yeah, well, goes without saying. <laughs> I was under the impression that it was the two spirit concept. That they're, they're, that's also part yeah. of it. Yeah, no, no. That gets that gets woven in, but that, that's not in those original things. I think yeah. what happens is that concept gets taken, yeah. and then the two spirit idea gets added, and then because there are and there are also Western cultures, so like the, um, the eunuch would be a version of this. Right. So yeah. so so there have been um, ways in which. Um, gender non-conforming people, either very often male, quite likely probably homosexual, mm. males have been given a particular social position inside various cultures, um, Hijira as well, eunuchs, there, there is a bunch of 
there's a bunch of them. The Two Spirit one is um, a classic. And one. there are variants on that, apparently. I mean, somebody picked you up on that, actually. One of the few criticisms I saw of the last discussion was they, they thought your characterization of the Two Spirit thing in Native American culture was too simplistic because there were actually all these different variants. But it didn't It's not my characterization, well, no. it's the characterization of the trans rights movement. Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not. I'm not an expert on the on the uh, variability of different ways in which um, the very many different tribes mm. of the Americas prior to colonization articulated um, and dealt with gender non-conforming people. Right. That has been kind of boiled down mm. to an idea of the two spirit. That there were these people that were neither male nor female, and that therefore that 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 was somehow, that shows that prior to us arriving and imposing our norms that there wasn't maleness and femaleness, that this is a, uh, yeah, as the judge, not the judge, hopefully not the judge, the, the, the prosecuting lawyer in the forced data case is claiming these are but, but, irrational, incoherent and conspiratorial ideas. I mean, it makes no sense either, because the concept of two-spirit only makes sense in relation to there being male and female yeah. people. It's like the, the Green Party's, the Green Party has recently, it's regional, uh, committee or something have they used to have a male and female co-chair to make sure that women were represented they have two people chairing the committee and now they decided they couldn't do that because they had to be inclusive of all the other genders so they have a non-male and, and a non-female non -female. Right. but then it's like well that you can't define those without reference to the biological right. reality right but in any and there's and there's also the fact that i mean that particularly the because because they've they've added non male now, but they started off with non with non women. Yeah, just non women. Then, that was it. There no, was non men. men. There, they yeah, ended up defining was, women as uh, non men. Yeah, yeah, they had men and non men. They had men yeah. and non men. Yeah. Right. And then which is which is kind of hilarious because because we would argue that that inversion is exactly how patriarchal gender has always worked. Men are the default. Yeah. And then women are defined as the inversion as the, as the opposite of whatever is defined as the male default. There is absolutely nothing progressive about defining female people as the inversion of men no. that that's just no. patriarchy in a nutshell yeah and it, it was i mean it, that originated i imagine some some probably well-meaning slightly clueless green party person with thinking they had a good idea about trying to include non-binary people and not right. not leave anyone out and not get in trouble for not being inclusive and then and then you end, then you end up if you have to have i mean this is what's happened in new york mm. right where they've basically been mm. like they used to have. I mean, this is this is. Uh, oh, the New York, New York Democratic, New York Democratic Party. Party. Yes, they this. used to have a male and a female representative, and that was put in right. place by the suffragettes, right. by the American suffragettes, right, right. to right. make sure that that's women got there, represented. That's yeah. been there for a hundred years in order to make sure there is a female yeah. representative yeah. involved in the democratic process, yeah. and now they've turned it to opposite or different but two, diff at least two at genders. At least two genders. So that can be two. So basically what you get, two you can men, have two male people. One who says they're non-binary. One who says they're non-binary or gender fluid or whatever. Or whatever yeah. And apparently that's that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw a fake picture. I mean it's pretty comical. This young, very obvious young man in a dress that made it his mission to A somewhat badly chosen dress we might yeah, add. Yeah. We'll, 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 I, I, I we'll skirt we'll skirt picture. over that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but basically um, took removed all sex-based language from the, the New York Democratic Party's um, policies to do with this kind of thing. So women have been effectively erased as a political group, and that was celebrated as incredibly progressive. And, and there was a the thing that was most offensive was mm. that there was a picture of <clears throat> of the young trans woman who is clearly male with a much older male, both of them white, mm. with their arms around each other. Like, look how progressive cele we are. Celebrating yeah. the erasure of the political representation of female people. Yeah. As, and I will repeat, which was put in place by, right. by the suffragettes. Yeah. yeah. It'd be very similar kind of body language and, and dynamic to that. I'd be probably seeing a little video that's, um... Yeah, there was, it, with the, with the, with the school board and the changing rooms. Yeah, so a, a, a young, uh, teenage male school high school student who chooses to identify as a young woman uh, wanted to be able to change with the young women in the swimming changing rooms and I think they offered initially a private a private room but that wasn't good enough this has happened before wants full validation and the progressive woke parent groups and various people voted yes and there was this interview with this young woman who just was you know 
clearly holding back tears, really upset that she didn't feel she wouldn't feel comfortable changing with male body people in her change room. What about her? It's all about making this person feel comfortable, but not her. And um, but then after the vote, there was this little clip and interviewing different people. And then after the clip, the young woman identifying teenage person uh, talks about how ecstatic they feel about this decision. And then this older man from the school board comes over and puts his arm around this person. And they're celebrating. As like, yeah, like, it was like teen men, yeah, go us. Um, and and, 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 and this is what the, the Maya Force Data case is about, fundamentally. Mm. The trans rights movement maintains that we are not allowed to note that that person is male, yeah, right? Yeah. And the point is, I mean, is, that, yeah. is that we live in a society which is structured around male dominance and in which female people's needs are always positioned as subservient to male people's needs and we are not allowed to look at an image of two male people mm. celebrating the removal of female people's rights or spaces and we're not allowed to observe That's that what's... they're male. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean just me saying, I'm being, I'm like sort of centering myself, trying to be careful not to use the wrong pronouns, it's like hang on a minute, there's a teenage boy who is just with his entitlement using you know political mechanisms to force himself into women's space and I'm even going oh I have to be really careful what I say like why do I have to be careful what I say why I mean yes this this young man may have been bullied may have you know had a hard time it, you know it's not easy being I mean I'm happy school, I mean we we all we all I mean this is an issue about the language right mm -hmm. and a lot of this debate is structured around the the fight around naming mm -hmm. like what can be named and I'm happy, I'm quite happy, and some women are not, and that's their choice and I understand why, to use the phrase trans woman, mm. as long as I'm allowed to point to the fact that trans women are male. Yes. <laughs> yes. And what is happening in the Maya Forstata case is that, is that, is that, is yeah, that yeah. Is we are defending whether we are legally allowed to point to the fact mm. that that the trans women are male and that their maleness is politically significant mm. because in a society that is structured around male dominance the fact that trans women are male is not politically irrelevant and effectively what is happening is that female people who have an analysis of this of the fact that that female oppression is sex-based and that the power structure is structured according to that axis mm are being told effectively that we are not allowed to name the axis of our own oppression. And apparently that's progressive. Apparently denying a group of oppressed persons the right to name the axis of their own oppression mm. is progressive. And that female persons who demand that they have the right to name that are being told that they're committing a hate crime. Yeah, so this trial is so this trial is quite important. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's been compared to a witch trial, interestingly, and quite perhaps you know appropriately. It, it's worth pointing out it, it's not Maya Forstater who is on trial. She, no, we, she we is. Brought, we brought the case. Yeah. So so it's it's her employers who are on trial for. Um, but the decision that makes that, that gets made by the judge is, is going to be um, is going to have massive implications. It's hard oh, to it will, imagine. it will become it will become effectively illegal for female people to name male people and to name that their maleness is relevant to how power is functioning. Yeah. Which is, so it's firstly an issue of whether we're allowed to name reality. Mm. Like, so it is a scientific fact that humans are sexually dimorphic. Um, <clears throat> the, trans rights, the trans rights movement is attempting to mandate that it is effectively a hate crime mm. to name that fact. And then secondly, that fact is politically salient to female people and we're being told that we're not allowed to name it. Yes. So there's an issue about <clears throat> politeness, right? And I fully understand the desire to be polite and to be kind, mm. right? But it is unreasonable to expect female people to be kind in a way that fundamentally undermines their political interests or their ability to name their own experience or their ability to name the, the mechanisms 
um, through which they're being subjugated. Yeah. I mean, and that's what's happening. I mean, imagine, imagine some, I don't know, group of indigenous people on a small island in, in Indonesia being like, you know, having their, their homeland destroyed by, you know, white European kind of corporate interest. If they weren't allowed to, to point this out or say anything about right. it, right. Or, or had to be polite, had to be kind, had right. to... You know, can't say. But, the, but, the, but, but what the trans rights movement has done is it's used the cis trans binary right. in order to flip the axis of oppression, to position female people as the oppressor, and therefore to claim that because we are the oppressor, we don't have the kind of rights to name that uh, that we would accord to a marginalised group. Because effectively, the structure is based on denying that female people are a marginalised group. Yeah, you're, if you're, female you're, if female, you're a privileged. If you're, group you're, now, a pri yeah. you're a privileged cis woman, yeah. right? So if female, if we understand that female people are oppressed as a class, mm. right? There is no way in a million years that leftist, that the fundamental structure of leftist thought would support the idea that you could remove the right of naming from an oppressed group and re refute, re remove the right for them to name the axis of their own oppression. But because the trans rights movement has quite successfully managed to obscure that by using the cis trans binary to like flip that, mm -hmm. because we're then, we're, we're then positioned as the oppressor, um, they can use that to say that it is legitimate for our, for our naming rights to be removed. Mm -hmm. And also that's the, 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 the cis trans binary and the way in which the cis trans binary flips the axis is also very important because that's what allows you just you just used uh, an example of colonization mm. right our experience of this is that it is colonization that, that members of the dominant class are attempting to appropriate our identity or not our identity because I hate the word identity mm. appropriate the, the material nature of our existence mm. and then use that appropriation in order to access all of our resources and our political representation and our sports and all of those things. Um, <clears throat> that I believe is the correct reading. It is a little bit more complicated insofar as trans people do experience discrimination. Mm. So there's a double reading. One is that you have two marginalised groups who are involved in a rights conflict, and one is that you have members of the dominant class attempting to appropriate and colonise the existence of the members of the subordinate class. Right. I think both of those things are true in different respects, because okay. I think trans women, males who identify as women, are both marginalised with respect to their failure to perform patriarchal masculinity correctly and gender non-conforming people are discriminated against yeah. in a patriarchal society and also at the same time they are males who have been socialised as males in a patriarchal culture and they are manifestly acting in a manner that that exhibits an enormous quantity of male entitlement. Yes, yeah. um, and if you wanted to convince female people that you were actually not male, um, appropriating their language, demanding access to all of their spaces, and then trying to force that through using coercion is probably the least effective way yeah, of convincing Because women us. have been socialised to not do those things and... Um, it looks yeah. it looks an awful lot like patriarchal male entitlement. It to does, us. yeah. And so. and particularly the coercive mechanisms, right? It's mm -hmm. exactly and also, I mean, you, you talk to any woman, right? Like as soon as a male person does not respect a female person's boundary to any um, female person who has a clear understanding of how the world works, what that tells us is that that person isn't safe. Mm. Right? So the fact that the trans rights movement has used such a kind of coercive, like demonising, uh, aggressive campaign against us, mm. um, we're like, we don't want you, like... The, yeah, and why on earth would you want these people the, in your places? You see all, yeah. all the trans baseball bats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, why do we want to let a bunch of male people wielding baseball bats Rainbow at coloured, us? Rainbow coloured, but pink right, and blue pink baseball. And baby pink and baby blue baseball bats at us, into our spaces. Mm. If you want to put t-shirts soaked in our blood so like mock soaked in our blood like in a public library it's along with an in San along Francisco. with along with an exhibition of baseball bats and pink and blue axes mm. right like and then you wonder why we don't want to open the door yeah. <laughs> it's literally like a male person 
like on like I mean like at the door with a bat banging <laughs> against the door like this and then you wonder yeah, the why, oppressor, and then you yeah. wonder why female people are like fuck no you can't come in sorry yeah <laughs> no <laughs> yeah I, it, it does well it just seems so obvious once you've seen it but I I think just to, I mean, again, a lot of people watching know about the, the, the prefix cis, but not everyone I used to, I still meet people who don't. Now, there'll be a lot of people in Britain today who've maybe heard it used for the first time or heard it and thought, oh, what, what is that? And it's because, again, we're coming up for an election. The leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, the kind of third party uh, in Britain, is a woman called Jo Swinson. Yes. So I, I don't know that much about her. Um, she she was praised in the press for her willingness to launch a new first nuclear strike about a week ago. Yeah. Um, in contradistinction to the Labour leader who said he wouldn't do that and was called a weak, you know, sort of uh, spineless kind of. Um... No patriarchy there. Would you ever be prepared to use a nuclear weapon? Yes. That was a brilliant short answer. Thank you very much. I think the idea of anyone ever using a nuclear weapon anywhere in the world is utterly appalling and terrible. It would result in the destruction of the lives and communities and environment for millions of people. And so I would be actively engaged to ensure that danger didn't come about. Yeah. Anyway, Joe Swinson was on um, the Andrew Marr show this morning, political Sunday morning chat show and was asked about male-bodied people in women's rape crisis centres and this kind of thing. And she used the prefix cis kind of as a virtue signalling, I would guess, to let the, the kind of young pseudo-progressive crowd know that she's down with them. Um, but she used the existence of domestic violence in lesbian relationships as um, a justification for allowing males... Basically saying, well, a woman in a rape crisis centre could be violently attacked by another woman, so why not just let anyone... Which is, which is, I mean, it's a perfect exemplification of the fact that the ideology forces... It forces you into a corner in which you have to deny that male pattern violence is a thing. Yeah, which is right? what she's doing. She's basically going, you, you're no always, you always, You always end up, you always end up in... There's a pussycat coming. That's all right. Come on. <laughs> um... You always end up having to deny that because our claim, right, is not that we think that, that trans people are inherently violent by virtue of being trans, right? Yeah. Our claim is that trans women are male yes. <laughs> and that male pattern violence is a statistical fact that it is a fact that male people represent a danger to female people. It is a fact that <clears throat> vast, 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 the overwhelming number of female people have experienced uh, male violence on a spectrum from like being harassed in the street to being stalked to experiencing domestic violence to attempted rape to rape. Right? And that is a very, very large number of women. Rape is not a tiny thing that only happens to small numbers of women. Um, and that women, therefore, have a reasonable reason to want spaces away from male people. And trans women are male. <laughs> That's our claim. And we're somehow supposed to believe that if a man simply through claiming to be a woman and it doesn't take anything more than that if the, if the new legislation is brought in that somehow that alone eliminates any possibility right. that that male the, person the, the is cla the claim is that having some kind of magic gender gender, identity. E gender essence yeah. or identity as a woman means you're not means that you are not male yeah. in a way that is statistically relevant. And the thing is, even if that were true, even if that were true and there was, you see a lot of kind of questionable science about, you know, brain scans and hormone levels and trans women being, you know, somehow distinct physically, neurologically or whatever, even if that were true, destroying the boundaries, women's boundaries, you know, through that kind of badly thought out policy means that you're basically opening the floodgates for any male-bodied person. So there's, there's, so there's, so there's, so there's, two, there, there, there's two issues. Firstly, if you have a policy of self-ID, mm. right, and given the way that the, the ideology has been disseminated, effectively public services are now in a position 
you know, changing rooms or pub toilets or whatever else, where the social norms by which women would keep males out of those spaces mm -hmm. are basically broken down, yeah. right? Because we have no way, at, at the point at which you say, um, you know, any male can be female simply by an act of identification, at the point where you have people like Alex Drummond, right? This is a bearded um, bloke who worked for Stonewall claiming to be a lesbian. Um, so, yeah. Going in schools as well, talking to kids about it. Right. I still don't know what it means when someone says they live full time as a trans woman, especially when they look like a bloke. I am a trans woman uh, and I live full time as a trans woman. What does it mean? Really, what, do, what does it actually mean? Let me introduce you to Alex Drummond. He's on the Trans Equality Advisory Board for an LGBT charity called Stonewall UK. Acceptance without exception, which is quite a big charity. They get funding from people like Arcus, Goldman Sachs, the Scottish government. This guy's obviously being taken seriously, so I just want to dissect some of what he's saying and give my take on it. But I'm also widening the bandwidth of, of how to be a woman. What do you think you're contributing to womanhood by widening the bandwidth? Why aren't you widening the bandwidth of being male? Because he likes wearing a skirt and he feels a bit like a woman for whatever the fuck that means. It is women that need to expand to make space for him rather than men that need to actually just accept blokes um, who like wearing skirts and not give them shit for it. Having dirty hands, that's like masculine. Does that mean having clean hands is feminine? Now, as a trans woman, if I'm fixing the car and I've got my boiler suit on, that doesn't take away my femininity. I... It doesn't make you female either, Alex. Our women are allowed to fix cars too. Do you believe that no woman would know that women can fix cars too until you came along to transplain fixing cars to women. I mean, I'd never even heard of transgender before the age of 40, and it was only when I was researching gender theory as part of my master's that I discovered all this like amazing science. Now, nah, Alex, I know you didn't learn any science on your gender theory course. Those courses are bullshit. Everyone knows that. Seriously, no one, no one, no one, no one respects those courses. Come on, just stop, Alex. The prospect of the thought of surgery terrifies me. Of course it terrifies you, Alex. They chop your cock off. So you're curious about the beard, huh? It's quite normal for blokes to have beards. It kind of deconstructs gender, it queers gender. Queers gender? I spent years trying to pass as male. Oh, fuck off, you wanker. You identify as lesbian. How do other women react to you? Alex Drummond. I've been in a long-term committed relationship for a long time now. Um, so I'm spoken for, but I certainly draw out the inner lesbian in women. Stonewall UK, acceptance without exception. Your fucking minds are so open, your brains have fallen out. Lesbians exist, and this is not it. You do not represent us. You are absolute fucking treacherous, money-taking bastard. Right, yes. Um, or anybody who looks clearly male, Right, and and there is no requirement for that person to um, make a meaningful transition. There's no way by which female people can then, you know, keep male people out of their their intimate spaces. I mean, like the University of Bristol, various other universities have explicitly put signs up oh, yeah. instructing women in those toilets that they have no right. Do not to, challenge someone. Do not challenge. Yeah. They have no right to question yeah. whether if anybody you, should be in their so toilets. Specifically, they know better than you do. Yeah. So, so don't, don't question them. So therefore, any man can walk into a female toilet and a woman can't, has, like the social norms by which normally those spaces would be kept female only yeah. have been completely undermined. Yeah, because it's not law. I mean, it's the way we've kept these things separate, women have ma managed to have a, some degree of safeguarding and it's never complete, of course. The argument is often, oh, well, a man can just go in there anyway. Yeah, well, yeah. at the point at which you're saying they're going to rape you anyway, yeah. I think you might have lost the case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the way I keep seeing this thing played over and over, and the Joe Swinton argument is an example of it, which is where you're basically going, well, your safeguarding isn't 100% complete. You could have your biologically female-only rape crisis centre, but some evil, violent lesbian woman could attack, uh, you know, sexually assault one of the women. So you... You can't have 100% safeguarding. So therefore, the solution, and seemingly, according to Joe Swinton, is let's not have any safeguarding. You know, well, yeah. she said, what she did say, I think, this morning, was that you have to do, and this is also the case that's been made about um, <clears throat> Karen White, mm. right? 
is Karen the, White's uh, a male sex offender that's been put in women's prisons and carried on being a sex where offender. He se where he yeah. sexually assaulted women. Um, is that is that the failure in the Karen White case is that an adequate risk assessment wasn't done. What people completely fail to remember is that we live in a society that is entirely saturated with male violence and in which <clears throat> we have no information in many cases that those men are violent, mm. right? So most rapes are not even reported. The rapes that are reported, most of them don't make it to trial and even if they do make it to trial we have, I mean, Essentially, the, 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 the rate of conviction to commission of rape is basically around 1%. Right. Like one, maybe between so one and two. A man who commits a rape has got like a one in 100 chance he's ever going to get convicted for Right. It. You can yeah. more or less rape with impunity. Yeah. And most men who have committed sexually violent crimes against females, there will be no record. Record of violent behaviour. There will behavior. be no yeah. record. Yeah. Right, Karen White was not on remand for sexual vi for, for sexual violence. Mm. The rape, the the previous rapes that Karen White had committed, only came to light afterwards. Mm. Um, the idea that you can screen out sexually violent males by doing background checks yeah. is completely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, there is, you know. <clears throat> I, I recognise it is unfair to males who are not sexually violent that they are profiled hmm. like as members of a class who pose a danger, but that is just the statistical yeah. fact. I mean, it's <laughs> like if I, if I go to use the loot and the men's is closed for cleaning or something, now if I just went in the women thinking, well I'm not a threat, I know I'm harmless, I just, I just need to have a pee, I don't threaten anything, like, don't worry about me, I'm fine. It's like, no, that's totally and, 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 that and, not and, and, acceptable. And, fe and feminism has long... I mean, this is what I don't understand. Like, the cognitive dissonance that is going on inside the minds of third-wave feminists is something I cannot get my head around. Mm. So, for example, we've long had a discourse in feminism about <clears throat> telling men that they shouldn't walk behind uh, a woman on a street at night, yeah. right? Because it scares us, yeah. right? And we did we did a whole load of stuff, right? In, and we we produced a, it was a thing called Schrodinger's Rapist, right? Okay. <clears throat> Which was basically like we're saying, we know you're not all violent, but what you have to understand is we have got no way you of telling. Know. Yeah, We've yeah, got yeah. no way of telling whether you just happen to be walking behind us, mm. or whether you're being predatory, or whether you're a threat, yeah. right? Yeah. And we will perceive you as a threat. Like, we will perceive all unknown males as threats until we have reason to believe yeah. that and you're not. <laughs> yeah, men are not brought up to realise this is going on. Right. I mean, I, I like to think I'm quite sensitive to, you know, people's, you know, just, just sensitive to the world around me and, and, and people's feelings and needs and so on. Uh, but it was only after all of this discussion and getting caught up in this debate where a lot of information about male pattern violence was presented to me, which didn't surprise me. I know it's going on, but I've always just thought, well, I'm not a threat. I'm, right. a, I'm one of the good ones. But I went into this laundry room uh, on campus at the university where I work, and there's only one door into this laundry room. And I came in and there was a young student girl unloading her washing machine. And she looked up at me and I just saw this look of just a little flash of horror of like, there's no way out of here. I'm yeah. stuck in here with a strange yeah. man. And then right. I think very quickly, it, just, it you know, she obviously read my body language or whatever and it, it you know, but I wouldn't, but have, the, but I wouldn't the, have clocked that before. I'd have just thought, right. well, I'd have just been going about my business. Like, well, I'm right. not a threat to anyone. Right. And I'm like, she needs to be feel safe, right. even if I am not a threat. Right. right. And that's men and, aren't and, and, to and, think about and, that. No, and, and we've spent quite a lot of time trying to do work around that and mm. trying to highlight that. So, you know, for example, we used to, you know, have this thing where we would basically be like, men, if you are walking behind a woman on an, on an empty street late at night, cross the cross road. The road. Yeah. Right, and I don't care if it's a pain in the ass, and I don't care if you feel upset about the fact that you're being implicated in something and you're one of the good guys. That woman will be frightened, and you need to indicate to her in a really clear way but that you're, you're not, not a threat. threat. Yeah. <laughs> and the easiest way to do that is to cross the road. Yeah. And the least, and the thing you should never do is if she crosses the road, cross after her. That will yeah. scare the shit out yeah. of her. Yeah, yeah, wait, cross another time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try and think of it from her point of view. That is really not men have just not 
on the whole being encouraged to do that. No, because they don't understand how frightened we are. No. And 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 because because sexual violence is just, is is you know um, repressed and I mean there has been a a certain amount of unconcealment of it over the last years with Me Too and these types of things, right? But because the because male people's interests are also served by the extent of that violence being unconcealed and be, um, being, being concealed, concealed. Yeah, yeah. and because of the nature of the stigma around it i mean men will often be like well i just don't believe that that you know that many women are, are sexually assaulted because none of the women i know tell me that and we're like we don't go around telling men like women talk about it among themselves yeah. but we don't tell men and a lot of women don't talk about it among themselves feminist women talk about it mm. and if you are well known as a feminist person women will um you know, women will tell you about, I've those, to you about will it. tell yeah, you yeah. those kinds of things because they know it's safe to tell you. Mm. But you're not going to tell a male person about that unless you know that that male person has the understanding around those issues for it to be safe for you to tell them that. And um, <clears throat> you know, women don't go around just disclosing that kind of stuff. And and it's getting it is getting better, but. The extent to which female people, um, exp and it's not coming out of nowhere. Statistically, male people are actually one of the most dangerous things mm. to women. Yeah. Right. <laughs> in terms of, um, you know, obviously there's things like cancer and blah, blah 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 blah. But in terms of like negotiable things that you come into contact with in the world that it is that, are, that, danger, are, that yeah, are potentially yeah. dangerous, men are fucking dangerous yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, and. Um, Women, you know, in order to feel... So there's issues around safety, and then there's also issues around dignity and privacy and comfort and these kinds of things, because we also live in a society in which we're extremely sexualised, in which we're perceived as objects. Women have a right to be naked, to undress in spaces where they are protected from the male gaze. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and men don't by and large understand that because they don't know what it's like to be consistently on the end mm. of that kind of social objectification um and yeah i mean like it's interesting in terms of the way in which this intersects with like leftist misogyny right because that thing about women being private property right mm. like um, sorry, being public property. But sorry, being yeah. public property. So, so the kind of yeah, the classic idea is that is that right wing men want to own an individual women, and left wing men just want all women to be like a collective resource, right? Mm. So, there is still, you know, and th this comes through in the discourses around pornography and the discourses around prostitution and these types of things. There is still a complete refusal to understand the effect on women as a class of being like the object of the male gaze and of male violence. Um, and obviously this, this becomes particularly difficult in relationship to uh, certain forms of articulations of trans identity because when a male person wants to perform a certain kind of sexualized femininity, many of us do not experience that as something that promotes a feeling of solidarity. <laughs> Let's just say that. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, Sean Fay kind of posing like a sort of blow up sex doll um, for the Amnesty International Women Making History pamphlet would be a particularly good example of that. And I'm not saying that's true of all forms of trans identity. No, no, right? but I know, a, I know, I know many trans women who do not perform a, a form of like gratuitously kind of sexualized there are femininity. some high profile ones like there are some, i mean monroe, monroe bergdorf, bergdorf is the classic yeah. example of this yeah and then monroe bergdorf kind of turns around and lectures us and says you know i mean it's a problem in third wave feminism in general where third wave feminism has decided in this very simplistic way oh well female sexuality was repressed by patriarchy that's not true right female sexuality um, in terms of performing femininity for men, has never been oppressed by patriarchy, right? Like, there's always been like large amounts of prostitution. There's always been burlesque. There's, you know, 
women performing for the male gaze is not something that has been like massively repressed by patriarchy. Maybe during the Victorian period, right. because it was very sexually repressive, mm. right? But it's not the case that throughout human history, women performing for the male gaze has been repressed. It may be true that authentic expressions of female sexuality mm. have been repressed. They're certainly still repressed in this culture. If you, if you wanted to think about how many cultural representations we have of actual female sexuality, you could probably count them on like a hand. Like, but when you have someone like Munro Bergdorf performing a very classic kind of idea of like, you know, female sexual sexuality in a way that looks extremely passive, kind of no expression, very blank stare, sitting there with your legs open, like wearing, you know, fuck me boots and like whatever else. And then they're basically like, women's sexuality has always been repressed, so this is why this is super empowering. And we're like, firstly, performing for the male gaze is not empowering. Secondly, that's not what female sexuality looks like. Thirdly, your identification with a patriarchal kind of pornified version of female sexuality doesn't tell me anything about you understanding anything about what it is to be female. No. Right? Because if you did understand what it meant to be female, you would understand that a lot of female people have a serious problem with this particular performance. <laughs> and that what we look at is you identifying with the objectification of women and then telling us that your identification with the objectification of women means that you're female. And it means, and, and that you can then have the right to tell women and that they can't then, talk about. And their then you can tell biology. us that we need to not talk about them. We need to not centre our bodies, then and then start lecturing us about how like we're not allowed to talk about reproductive rights and the women's march because it's alienating mm. for you. Yeah. Like, and it's it's it's. I mean, this is the thing with with you know. The issue is 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 to do with the recognition of difference, right? It's like. I'm not saying, you know, that there is not meaningful articulations of your identity, right? But you're not the same as us, mm -hmm. and you don't understand what our experience is. And I'm not saying all of our experience is the same, right? So, okay, I'll do the little intersectionality thing. Obviously, not all women's experience is the same, and it is inflected by lots and lots of different things. But the way in which intersectionality has been used to deny that there is any common experiences that female people have in a patriarchal culture is kind of bullshit, right? right. So, so there's so idea that there most, is no most women ones. share an experience yeah. of being um, in some way, and it might be differently, but in some way sexualized, objectified, of having their subjectivity undermined because of the way in which they are positioned as kind of sexual objects, in way in which they're not allowed to express sexual subjectivity or not allowed to express subjectivity in general, mm -hmm. right? So, um, identification, women's experience of the way in which that affects them and the way in which patriarchy and the way in which gender damages their subjectivity is not something that people who are not female experience in the same way mm. because they're not subject to the same power mechanisms, right? And it's quite insulting when we are told that things like our sexual objectification, which many of us experience as profoundly damaging to our humanity, are the definition of what, of what we are. What you are, yeah. <laughs> That's very, very offensive. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then the people doing it are held up as sort and, of And then when we say it, and then when, and yeah, when the people holding it up are celebrated, and then we, when we object to it and find it offensive, we're accused of being hateful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and we talked about Rachel Dolezal earlier, right? This is the, the white woman who this identified is, as black, yeah. The response of the African-American community to that was no fuck off, right? Mm. Absolutely fine. Yeah, the left, the left was totally And the left okay completely that, yeah. accepted that the African-American community had every right to be like, you're appropriating our identity, you don't know anything about what it's like to be us, you're a privileged white woman, you can choose to change your identity anytime you like, you were not brought up in a society that, you know, in a culture that was informed by the legacy of slavery, like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, right? And, like, no. And that was absolutely accepted by the left. 
Yeah, nobody defended her, did they? I mean, yeah. Almost was, nobody. Yeah. Almost nobody. And anyone that defended her was piled on. Yeah. And I, I have... There's no question about that, mm. right? The question that we, we, we want to ask is, and this is not to say that the experience of oppression of African-Americans is analogous to the experience of oppression of women, just to make that, but they are, they are both forms of structural oppression. And the question, oh dear, the question that we want to ask is, nobody has been able to articulate why it was perfectly acceptable for the African-American community to say you don't understand our experience and you don't have a right to identify as a yeah. member of this group because you're not, you have not been positioned materially by society in a place that means you understand our experience. Yeah. And that was perfectly acceptable. But when we say the same thing, it's considered to be an act of egregious hatred. Yeah, yeah. And, that, that, and no, no one's, one's been, no, no one, one can explain, explain why. No, no, it's just like, it's a sort of, you sort of buy into the package. A lot of a lot of uh, contemporary progressive politics, it seems to be a sort of, you buy this whole package deal. So you want to be this kind of person who has progressive beliefs. So you've got to, you know, you've got to support. Well, you've got you've got to believe that trans women are women. That's like one of the axioms. And you're against fascism, and you're you know you're you're against climate change. And there's a sort of package of beliefs, but you. you it's a catechism, and, actually. And you, you're not really encouraged to think them out individually. Trans so. women are women, sex work is work. But Ra the Rachel Dolezal is an evil woman guilty of cultural appropriation. Um, and, you know, I have, I have a friend who um, I didn't exactly fall out with, but who, who was sort of quite uh, taken aback by some of my ideas around the gender debate. And she she's in the kind of art school world, in a sort of <coughs> particular ideological sort of bubble, perhaps. Um, but she was. She came back to England from her um, time away in Scandinavia, went to a festival, and was deeply shocked by all the white people with dreadlocks. Who, right. who she would have been around in the previous years, but never really um, given any thought to. But she was kept going on to me about how terrible this was. These white people with dreadlocks and cultural appropriation. And I was like I was trying to listen and understand where she was coming from. But she completely buys the, you know. Gender identity. Everyone is. Every, just people are what they say they are, and that's it. And like, I mean, and, and this is interesting as what you were saying about Marina's tweet, right? Mm. Okay, the let me issue, just explain this tweet because we, okay. we, you mentioned it, but I did, we never looked at it. But I'll put it up on the screen. Marina, a colleague of, of Jane, tweeted something along the lines of, "People might say that transracialism isn't a thing, i.e., Rachel Dolezal is just a one-off anomaly. There's not a problem with this, um, and trans age is just trolling, and that's a reference to." A 69 year old Dutchman who actually went to court to try and lower his age on his birth certificate. Some people think he was trolling, some people think he actually meant to do that. Um, there, there are also um, some rather confused people identifying as small children and this kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, she says, despite some people going, oh, don't worry about this, this is just outliers, I can see a new type of folk epistemology coming down the pipe at us. And we, we don't, I can't see what, what shape this is going to take, but we need to start thinking about it. And I saw that tweet, and I thought, there's something really deep and interesting here. This phrase, folk epistemology, this whole new rethinking of what is, what is real, um, coming from an unexpected place. So, yeah, so your reference to that, that tweet, you, I mean, we were talking earlier about... Well, I mean, I mean this, is, this is the thing, is that, is that there was the Rachel Dolezal case, yeah. um, and then somebody wrote that there was the Tuval case. The which case? Uh, Rebecca Tuval, she yeah. wrote uh, uh, an article in a feminist philosophy journal called Hypatia in which she used uh, the logic of the trans of transgender ideology in order to argue for transracialism. Okay, right? right. And she was absolutely massacred. She and was, was, she, was, was she sincere or was she trying to just no, point no, out No, no, the... no, 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 she was completely sincere, right. I believe. I think she probably didn't know that she was walking into such a loaded okay. field. Right. Um, but this this article was massively denounced by the academic community. A letter was written, which was signed, I think, by Judith Butler, among other people. Um, pressure was put on the board. The board of, I think, associate editors wrote a, a, wrote a, wrote a response in which they apologised for having done something so terrible and the way in which it had hurt people. And 
then they were sacked and then I think the board was changed and essentially it, it was a big it was a big controversy you look it up on Wikipedia I think mm. it's called the Hypatia Transracialism Controversy okay. right so that was about two or three years ago my my perspective on that controversy was that the, the the reason for that controversy is that that analogy is not allowed is not allowed to be made we have to accept on faith that transracialism is not a thing mm. and that there is no analogy with the logic of trans ideology um, it's it, it's a to some extent it's kind of like a you know it's a reductio ad, ad absurdum you like you push it and then you get to trans age and blah 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 and then you go no way. but <clears throat> once you've once you have allowed the principle that people's personal acts of identification override the materiality of yeah. their of their being and that people are allowed to identify into classes that they don't materially belong to I don't actually see where you can draw I don't see where you can draw a line well, no. and now we have for example UCU the University um, Union for college lecturers saying that they accept people identifying on the base self-identifying on the basis of race sex and disability, disability. Yeah. and this was also put to the uh, one of the witnesses uh, for the defendants in the Maya Forstata case who said under oath in court that as far as they were concerned um, in their institution Rachel Dolezal is black because she says she is so that from their point of view she is yeah, yeah. and then, I mean that's going to happen because once you've accepted that logic, yeah. I don't see how you, you could, how you could and, claim yeah. Yeah. that Rachel Dolezal isn't black, mm. right? And and there are we accept the reasons why that's problem problematic, much as I hate that phrase, right? And like I say, I'm not saying that the oppression of African Americans is identical to the oppression of women, right? But as forms of structural oppression, we both we both belong to groups that are materially based and who have been subject to mechanisms of power and people from classes who are not raised in in situated in those positions have different experiences and that's politically important. And um we might want to say something like, and I, I find it problematic from an epistemological point of view, how you can say Rachel Dollar's identification is not real mm. in some way. Like, bec the only way you can do that is to believe in magic gender yeah. essence. Yeah, the, the only, the only claim you is female, but only, Rachel Dollar's the, the, only, the only claim that you can ground that on is that trans people have magic gender essence and there is no equivalent magic race essence and yeah. therefore transracialism is not yeah. real and gender identity mm. is real i suppose it's been, it's been but I, gender identity is a concept right mm. there's no material phenomenon the no. only material phenomenon that exists is gender dysphoria yeah. That's a material phenomenon. But, but we're told that you don't have to have that, 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 that you can have a gender <laughs> identity mismatch without the gender dysphoria, or it should, could just be a matter of personal choice, that dysphoria... It's the, the demedicalisation is to remove the last trace of any material link to right. anything. Right. I mean, you do see these occasional quoted, supposedly scientific articles showing some subtle differences in, in brain activity and this kind of thing. But to you, know what, you know what's interesting about those articles mm. is that once you control for sexual orientation, yeah. the only thing that remains as a consistent difference between people with gender dysphoria and mm. people who do not is the part of the brain that is to do with body mapping. Okay. Right? right. Which makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm prepared to accept that there might be a material basis for, for a dysphoria. phenomenon yeah, like yeah, gender yeah, dysphoria. Yeah, yeah. But, but right? what we're talking about And I'm also prepared to accept that transition might be the best way of alleviating that distress for some of those people but I'm, yeah, i don't yeah. accept that there's magic woman essence and i don't yeah. accept that anyone who says they have magic woman essence is therefore a woman and <laughs> this is what we're and this is being written into law and policy and it's, it's a metaphysical belief system it's something you can't invalidate it, you know there's no there's no scientific basis for inv invalidating it, it but yet no you have to ask owen jones oh he has the sorting oh, hat that's right yeah so janice turner okay this is an interesting event that happened in the in the last year since we spoke so a British pop singer called Sam Smith, uh, who I I think I thought was gay. I don't it doesn't matter. He's gay. He's gay. He's open. He was he was just a gay pop singer, um, and then he started tweeting some strange stuff about his inner woman, 
and then he decided, and then he spoke to Stonewall and various, various organisations. Paris Leaves, I think. Yeah, various high profile sort of trans activists. And then he made a big public announcement that he was now non-binary and that he would wish to be referred to with the pronoun they. And so a lot of people in Britain hadn't really come across this non-binary thing before, maybe vaguely, but not really given it any thought. And so suddenly it was, you know, everyone was talking about what is this non-binary thing? largely mocked and ridiculed in, in some causes, quite cruelly in some cases and more rigorously in others. But the Times journalist Janice Turner, who's been quite gender critical in her writing lately, um, she just said, well, you know, in what sense is Sam Smith non-binary and I'm not? It, basically the point being, no, none of us can form entirely to male or female sex stereotypes. So either we're all non-binary or, or none of us are. And um, and so Owen Jones replied to Owen Jones, the, the smug Guardian um, commentator, replied to Janice Turner, um, you're not, OK, thanks, good night, sort of like just dismissed her. I, I'm going to decide Sam Smith is non-binary because he says he is and I believe he's sincere and you're not. And so I can decide you're not non-binary. Um, so we all need an Owen Jones to, to decide on. We need a magic Owen Jones sorting hat. Yeah. But I mean, this is the thing, and this is the claim that we've been making, right? Hmm. As soon as you as soon as you break the link with any kind of material structure, yeah. Whether that is, you know, and 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 maybe when we're talking about reports of psychic distress, we are, whether that's material or not, is a is, but. As soon as you move to a point where there's you have there's no relationship to the materiality of the class that you belong to, and there's no medicalized system, and you only have self -asso self assertion, there is in principle no way of distinguishing. Mm. Right, there there is no um, there is no way of distinguishing between someone who is trans in a meaningful sense and someone who's just decided that they're trans. Yeah. But I mean, and then this this throws up all of these kinds of crazy things like <clears throat> Jonathan Yanni, right? Oh or, God, yeah. I'm surprised by the lack of people talking about this person because what this guy is doing is not okay. Because no matter what you say, Jonathan, or Jesse as he calls himself, is a fake, lying, disgusting human being who preys on people, especially young people, and will hurt anyone who dares to step in his way. Jonathan first gained attention in media outlets after he filed 16 different lawsuits on 16 different spas and salons because they refused to follow his demands as he demanded them to wax him. But not just anywhere, but wax him in the lower region, aka the genitals. However, Jonathan isn't a woman and still has male genitalia. But because Jonathan says he's a woman, he believes he's entitled to demand these salons to wax him, even when, as pointed out during the cases, it is a very intimate service that is sometimes performed by women who are themselves vulnerable. This guy in question we're dealing with here, he's a violent, disgusting individual who uses gender to try and get away with the reality that he's nothing more than a predator. You see, Jonathan claims to be a lot of things, along with trying to make out that he is disabled, with videos showing him rolling around on a scooter when out and about. However, he didn't seem to be very disabled when he was running, walking, and even attacking people who only wanted an interview with him, so... Don't you touch me! You're not going to go close to Get out. Get away. Don't you. Get away. You better Get not. Away. You better Get not. Away. No. You make you contact. Away. You're going to go to jail. The fact that he's wasting our taxes on endless lawsuits because he demands that women touch his little private area is pretty pathetic. But the biggest thing which makes me angry about this individual is his twisted attempts on manipulating young people and preying on them, such as his alleged messages towards young teenagers asking about tampons, if they get their boobs out in gym or so on. And then of course there was his tweet responding to the story about a judge ruling that girls have no right to visual bodily privacy. And he was celebrating that saying, yes, 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 why should they have the right to privacy? Which continues to show how creepy this individual is. But the worst thing that he has tried to do was when he tried to set up an all-body swim for teenagers 12 and over. He tried to set up a swimming pool party for kids, where the kids would be walking around topless. And if you read the bottom of the info, you will notice the cherry on the fucking shitcake. Caretakers and parents are not allowed to attend the event as, according to him, it's considered safe. Right, where the trans rights movement then, you end up with like a no true Scotsman argument, right? Where the trans rights movement starts saying, well that person wasn't really trans. 
right? Jonathan Yaniv, Jonathan Yaniv is just a nasty, predatory man. He's not really, he's not really trans. But up, up until that point, <coughs> they've been saying acceptance without exception. People are what they say they are. You know, what, no one would ever lie about that. No one would ever lie about it. So it's like, so it's like, you know, and then now we're getting this very large wave of female detransitioners, which mm. we predicted yeah. because it was very clear from the information that we were getting that large numbers there because there was this massive increase in teenage in, girls in teenage yeah. girls identifying as trans from a feminist perspective it is incredibly obvious mm. i mean and so i mean this is this is an important point historically transsexualism has been predominantly a male to female yeah almost Phenomenal. it was like 90 some percent for, for years right? yeah, yeah under what is happening with this large ideological dissemination and social movement attached to it is that the numbers of referrals to gender identity clinics from teenagers began to show a, a, a large disproportion of female yeah. to young, male young, young women wanting to become men from a feminist yeah. perspective there's a very there's a very clear set of reasons why that would be a case right because going through pu going through puberty in a patriarchy is actually a very traumatic experience because you suddenly lose your status as a person, right? You become an object. It's yeah. terrifying. Um, and there's very little social support for it. Yeah, you're talking about going through puberty as a woman, in this case. As yeah, a woman, yeah, yeah. right? You, um, there's very large numbers of eating disorders. Women have, like, teenage girls have very high mental health problems. There's lots of cutting. There's lots of, like, yeah. okay. All their peers, the male peers are all watching hardcore pornography on their smartphones and right. getting their ideas about women from gangster there's lots rap. Of, there's, and, there's, I mean, there's, there's lots of, and it, it's become a lot worse recently. Then you add in the fact that you've got lesbian girls, girls that have had a lot of sexual trauma, um, girls with autism, and um, it's not that difficult to understand why in a patriarchal culture when female, like, also, there's, there's a lot of body hatred, women. Being slightly dysphoric about your body is kind of a normal condition for a teenage girl, mm -hmm. right, in this culture. Um, it's not difficult to understand why lots of young female people would experience a lot of distress, and if you gave them an option of, of, of opting out of all of that and and moving to the position of being a full human subject which is the male box mm. why that would not be attractive so <clears throat> we anticipated when we realized that there was this huge increase we anticipated that a lot of those girls were kind of getting caught up in this social phenomenon and being sucked into it in ways that you know and that their decisions to transition were informed by things that you know were not actually profound, long-lasting gender dysphoria that could. Yeah, there's, there's this phenomenon of what, what got called rapid onset gender dysphoria by uh, was it Susan Littman, I think her name was. She Lisa, did, she, Lisa she, Littman. She did the study. Yeah, I don't, she, she didn't, didn't name she it. She didn't yeah. name it. Anyway, she, she did the first study, the first, which was also like jumped on by the trans. Yeah, it, basically there are people arguing there is no such thing. It's it's it's. it's, it's it's fake science. It's all it's all made up. There's no such thing. But in reality, we've seen this massive, massive increase in young girls turning up at gender clinics, being put on testosterone, having double mastectomies ridiculously early, and then lots of them are now starting to regret it because they're realising it's not helping. They're not being. It doesn't. It, it it's not helping them, and it's the incorrect analysis of the problem. Yeah. Right. Um, um, and also, I mean, I think the thing that's very hard for us is that obviously we think we have an analysis of the problem that would actually help them understand what is happening to them and right. leave them onto a path that is both reality and acceptance based. Mm. And it's not easy because it's not easy to confront what it is to right. be a female person in this culture. But, you know, the truth will set you free. Mm. Ultimately, first it will piss you off. That's the, yeah. famous, that's the famous quote. But, but um, uh, and, it, and so they're actually being blocked because of the demonization of radical feminism and the figure of the turf. Those young women are basically inside an ideological bubble in which their access to an oh, analysis yeah. they're insulated that, would, from a, that yeah. would help them understand what's happening yeah, to it's them. like this is, radioactive is being, ideology they can't go anywhere near is being yeah. is being blocked yeah a lot of those women are now not 
beginning to detransition. Yeah. Some of them, I mean, it, it's interesting, right? A few weeks ago, <clears throat> I, I've been, I, I've been extremely lucky in this situation. Many, many of the women I know fighting this battle on my side have lost very, very close personal friends. They've fallen out with family members. They've been socially ostracised. They've had to deal with. Re I've, I've been very lucky because I was already in kind of community with radical feminists okay. when this happened. So I had, I, and my and most of my closest friends are feminists, and so I didn't. I didn't suffer the same kind of um, social uh, consequences in many respects. But I did get into a conversation on Twitter with uh, someone I'm very close to who I care about a great deal, and I know he does not agree with me. Um, and we've mostly just avoided it. But anyway, we got into a little bit of an exchange, and I was quite upset about it. And a couple of days after that, I went to actually the LGB Alliance meeting, and um, Charlie who's running the Detransitioner uh, Advocacy Network, yeah. came up to me and she said, I just wanted to thank you because it was your and Kathleen's writing that helped me understand what was happening. And I was like, everything's fine. Like, I'm very upset about this friend of mine, but if one yeah. young woman can find her way, out, find of her way out of that, that reality distortion bubble mm. before she's cut off her breasts or sterilised herself, then I can live with myself. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. And it won't just be her. I mean, she's she's working full on to, to build like a communication network. And she's doing network. amazing work. Yeah. Charlie's great. She's um, doing amazing work. Yeah, I, there, was a, there was a video as well, a very moving video by a teenage girl called um, <coughs> Alfie, who had been transitioning um, and then, and then realised somehow, just I think mainly just through her own introspection, wait a minute, I, you know, I can't, my, my sex is immutable, I am female, I'm basically, I'm a lesbian, my, and you, what is this, you can't identify, you know, she just saw through the whole I identify as thing. I don't feel like a woman, and I don't feel like a man. I am female, and that's all there is to it. I don't need to feel like anything to justify the fact that my female body likes to do, say, and think things that women aren't supposed to do. The terminology of identifying as male or female was always something I was a bit suspicious of and now I fully loathe it. I identify as as a metalhead, as you can see, um, a painter, I identify as left wing politically, I don't identify as male or female. You can't identify as male or female or intersex, you just are. It's an immutable reality, not a wishy-washy identity. This is such an obvious statement that it feels impossible that this simple truth could be a completely life-altering conclusion to come to. But that's how deep in this I had got myself. I spent the last five years doing mental gymnastics, sometimes agile and impressive, and sometimes clunky and contradictory. Like I said, I was desperately trying to wrangle impossible logic around an untruth because I was too far in to, for, to turn back, or not, as is the case. Otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here, would I? You're not too far in to turn back. I mean, it's, 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 it's setting young women up for like constant pain mm. because they are going to be perceived as, I mean, maybe if they go through full transition, they will no longer be perceived, but if they identify as non-binary, for example, they're largely going to be perceived as female. They're still going to be subject to the same the kind same, of yeah, yeah. same kind of shit that gets thrown at every other female person. Like if if a man wants to like curb crawl you, he's not going to stop and ask you how you identify before he does it. If someone wants to pay you less or treat you as less human, mm. they're not going to ask your pronouns before they do it. It's setting young women up for an idea that they can individually opt out yeah. of being an oppressed class of person and mm. you can't it's structural yeah yeah <laughs> yeah there was that magdalene burns video um magdalene burns passed away sadly in the last year but she made some made really yeah made some very um cutting truthful uh videos one of them she she compared a woman in in london who'd um basically was being forced to wear high heel to choose to work and refused to and lost her job right basically standing up for all the other women to this smug, I'm afraid, young 
non-binary identifying woman in New York who um, basically went to her employers going, I don't want to have to wear these clothes, so I'm going to I'm going to identify as male, and they made an exception for her and got like you know brownie points for their work. No, I mean, and it's thing. it's a very it's a very very good example. For four years, I was too afraid to rock the boat. Thus, I showed up every day in a dress and heels. A dress and heels. See, this really shocks me. I can really understand why, if you're doing like a self-employed job, you might just let it go. But for four years you sat there and worn high heels and a skirt. I can't imagine that I would never do that. Me in a dress and heels. Y'all wouldn't recognize me. Four years. How did I do it? Four years. Great question. The answer is compartmentalization and disassociation. But what about all the other women working with you, Ash? This is um, a very significant report triggered by your petition. Absolutely. And they have agreed that it is sexist to require women to wear heels to work. My confidence in the guy's outfit being a viable option for me started to grow. Then I booked my top surgery. As if getting top surgery somehow justifies her unreasonable desire to wear comfortable clothes. I figured soon I wouldn't even have the boobs to fit into lady things. Ridiculous, like why shouldn't she just be able to wear comfortable clothes? Like why isn't she challenging the fact that she's not allowed to wear comfortable clothes? Why does she have to get top surgery? Then I opened up in regards to my trans identity. But why do you have to disclose a trans identity just to wear comfortable clothes? And went on to explain that because of who I am, I might be more happy and myself at work if I could make a change in what I was wearing on the job. We're folks struggle to be themselves at work because they believe that conformity is critical to their long-term career advancement. And what are you doing to help these people? Conforming. That's what you're doing. Do you realize that? And that's how I felt. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I didn't want to rock the boat. I wanted to blend in and conform to what most of my colleagues were doing. We get that you didn't want to rock the boat. It's fucking pathetic. But somehow I had done it. I had mustered the courage to send the email that I had been thinking about sending for years. And do you know what happened? A couple weeks later, I hopped on a call with a hella friendly HR rep who basically said, cool, sounds good. There was a short process involved. What, why was there a process involved? All you wanted to do was wear comfortable clothes. I had to answer some questions, fill out a form, let my personal manager supervisor guy know what was going on. So you had to do all that stuff just to be able to wear clothes that made you feel comfortable. I was incredibly pleased though, because it was ultimately pushback free. Go you. And I didn't have to prove anything or make a case for myself. You had to go and fucking set up top surgery and you had to go through these hoops, all because you can't fucking accept that you are oppressed on the basis of being female. That's what's going on here. I'd figure it went 95% perfectly. You still work for a sexist company with a sexist policy. You haven't changed shit. Wake up. My company's attitude was 100% open and accepting. They employed a policy which said that women and men have to dress differently and yet you're still apologising for them. At one point, my individual manager even called me on the phone just to tell me how proud he was of me. That's the difference between challenging actual sexism and being a pathetic trans activist. When you're a pathetic trans activist, you get thanks by your employers. When you're actually challenging the status quo, you don't. You get sacked. Because it ended up with you getting the sack, didn't it? I did, yes. I lost my job as a receptionist. Mm. Right. The young non-binary females, I, I feel very, <clears throat> I feel very, very ambivalent and difficult about it because I understand what is driving them mm. and I understand the difficulties and what they're trying to negotiate. When we criticise them, they don't seem to understand that we're not criticising them for being gender non-conforming. No. We're criticising them for taking an individualist solution to a structural yeah. problem. Yeah, exactly that. And, yeah. um, and effectively, it's what they're doing by doing that is saying it's okay to treat all those other boring cis women like this. Because mm, I'm special. <laughs> but I'm special. Yeah. I have... And what it feels like to me, actually, is them going, I have magic in a human essence that you can't see. So I'm going to identify out of the subhuman box, right? right? So I can, I can be perceived as being properly human. Yeah. But it's 
absolutely fine for you to carry on treating the rest of those female people as if they're less human than everyone else. Yeah. And and that I don't want to be angry with them because I understand the see, yeah, I can yeah. understand the structural issues that are causing them to behave in that way, but I find it it's internalized misogyny actually. Mm. It's internalized misogyny and they can't see it and they don't understand. I got into an argument on Twitter a couple of months ago with a with a non-binary woman female from the states and and it was it was kind of amazing because she started this series of tweets by saying you know as soon as i realized there was an exit i was like running for the door right which obviously pissed us off because mm -hmm. that's it was kind of interesting that she didn't understand that she was articulating exactly the structure of the reason why we're critical right and we were like right so you decided to take a life raft and run off and like leave all the, leave else, everyone yeah. else behind like and this is like incredibly neoliberal it's a betrayal of class politics yeah. it's anti-materialistic it's hyper it's like, individualist it's really hyper individualist yeah. and we kind of got into this back and forth for a while it and then she just recited you know colonialism invented the gender binary blah blah right. intersex blah clownfish blah 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 at me and i was like you are completely failing to understand the point that we're making and the hilarious thing at some point someone turned up and like looked at my profile and then was this like there was two things there's two very characteristic things one someone looked at my profile and was like oh she's a prince fan she's obviously confused and i was and i was and, and we i get this i get this thrown in my face quite often like how can you be a prince fan and i'm like it it's got nothing to do with us dislike like look at us like you know I always want to say to those to to those crowds outside our meetings, like, look, you're shouting at a bunch of gender non-conforming women, yeah. right? Like, we're not all tottering out of these places with our like flowery dresses and like you know fascinators on, and the issue is not gender non-conformity. The issue is how you understand yeah. gender yeah. non-conformity yeah. and what it means, right? And the other <laughs> the other thing is that I got a like okay boomer thing. Like they've decided we're all boomers. Right. We're like we're Gen X. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously, they don't she even can't know what understand that means, anything. Yeah. yeah, no historical understanding at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no historical understanding whatsoever. Yeah. Like ev everyone who's like over thirty is like a boomer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whatever. Just yeah. Um, just to clarify the clownfish reference, because this we've got to do the clownfish thing. Can't leave that out. Can't forget the clownfish. Um, and so, and you mentioned intersex conditions. So this often these these arguments often will degenerate, where <laughs> any type of rational argument sort of disintegrates, and you end up with uh, an appeal to clownfish, which are sequential the, hermaphrodites. The, the, the appeal to clownfish. Yeah. That's what we call it. So um, uh, clownfish can produce both types of gametes, um, and uh, they, they they change from one to the other. Uh, but they're fish. They're not mammals. We aren't clownfish. We're not. And, we're not sequential hermaphrodites. And, um, and intersex conditions. Some humans have developmental sexual disorders. They are male or female, but their their reproductive system doesn't develop in the way it was. Well, it, it would normally. Um, and this is a medical condition which requires treatment and and um, medical oversight. These people are not identifying as anything, and yet somehow they are being used all the time in these arguments. The existence of intersex people was used in the Maya Forstater trial, keep coming back to that, the prosecution lawyer attacking her claims of biological sexual sex being real, um, basically started spouting all this stuff about rare intersex conditions and different types of chromosomes, as if somehow the existence of people with developmental sexual disorders means that Sean Fay can Sean, Sean Fay can just say I'm a woman because I say I am. Enjoy your. I mean, there's, I mean, there's there's two there's two things. I think there's two main points to make about this. Yeah. Firstly, the development of in, like most people with intersex conditions are either male or female. Yeah. Right. Secondly, there is a very 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 small number of indeterminacies, and it's tiny. Yeah. Tiny tiny tiny. Right. Over ninety nine percent are either male or female. So the fact that there is a small number of... 99 point nine, nine thought, is yeah, something yeah, really yeah. high. Yeah, yeah 99.7, I think it is, okay. or something. But it's very high. Um, and that figure, the, the, they're as common as redheads, was, oh, pre yeah, was, yeah. Pre was produced by counting congenital adrenal hyperplasia, late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is um, not... An, it is an intersex condition, but it's not an unambiguous one. Right. Um, 
So uh, there's a very, very small number of genuine ambiguities, right? Mm -hmm. Which doesn't demonstrate, I mean, it doesn't demonstrate that humans are not sexually dimorphic any more than the, than, um, the fact that some humans are born without limbs, yeah. born, born without legs, demonstrates that humans are not bipedal. Or that the fact that like, polydactyly exists demonstrates that humans don't have five. Like, there, there, are, there are disorders of development mm. which cause certain kinds of deformations of stand, the, the standard characteristics of the class, and that exists all across animal life, yeah. you know, you might as well say that al albino zebras demonstrate that zebras aren't striped, mm -hmm. right? There's a difference between the characteristics of the class and then there being occasional deviations from the characteristics of the class. They don't invalidate the characteristics mm -hmm. of the class. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, even were it true yeah. <laughs> that sex was a spectrum... Which is what they keep arguing. They try and It use would not in... prove that male people are female. Yeah, yeah in a spectrum. <laughs> a spectrum, you can't just go this... You this, can't just slide along it. Like, yeah, you, just... people say, it's like, you, it's effectively, that argument is effectively like saying that the existence of green proves that yellow is blue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it really makes no sense, and yet it gets thrown it makes out. No all sense. It gets all no. used so often. And almost none of the people using the argument actually have any of these conditions. They're just kind of weaponizing them rhetorically and, and confusing the public. So I, 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 you know, when these things come up with people who haven't been following the debate, often they'll go, oh, but aren't there those people with their own between, you know, they, they, they've heard something vaguely and they're like not quite sure. But as you've pointed out yourself, you know, what's, what's happened where, you know, feminists now have to like have a detailed knowledge of these intersex developmental disorders in order to have a, you know, kind of a reasonable debate about women's rights. Right, no, Why so, is that seriously, even a thing? In order to assert that female people exist under the current set of political conditions, yeah. we have to understand all of the permutations of, chromosomal of, disorders of, chromo and, of chromosomal yeah. disorders. Um, so I mean, it, it was just completely bonkers. It's really. a smokescreen, effectively it's a smokescreen, and the clownfish things were ridiculous. But rather alarmingly, there's a, there's a woman, uh, Alice Roberts, she's a professor of uh, public engagement of science. Public uh, disinformation in science. Uh, yeah, she's at Birmingham. She's a, a biological anthropologist, amazingly. Um, I mean, considering what she's done, which is... And she's also, I think she's at the head or very high up in the UK humanists movement, yeah. uh, secular humanism. So they're all about rationality, but um, she's basically decided that kindness overrides rationality. So in discussions about... Um, these issues about biological sex, she's basically come out and gone, no, it's not binary, it's all messy and, un and complicated, just go ask a clownfish. Um, and she's kind of trying to position herself and please everybody, I think. Um, well, I don't think she's trying to please everyone. Well, no, she's, not, she's, she's not trying to please us. No. She's basically, I mean, she's done a lot of, like, you know, she retweeted uh, an article that was written in Vox, one of those, like, why British women are such terrible, evil... Oh, terms. and how you, you, you're all biological essentialists who do it. <clears throat> teaming up with the far right and that kind of thing. I mean, thing. that's, yeah, that's yeah. one of the arguments about biological essentialism, but apparently now just believing that natural kinds exist is mm. biological essentialism, so yeah. believing that cats exist is biological essentialism, yeah. and believing carrots exist is biological essentialism. That's literally mm. what they're saying. Mm. Carrots are a social construct, as are cats. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. So there's that. There's the kind of... On one hand, this kind of muddying, smoke screeny, oh, it's all so complicated, we can't possibly know, it's so difficult, it's socially constructed. And then at the same time, there's this kind of pivot, which is just like, just agree because you have to be nice. Yeah. Right? And, and I mean, this is one of the things we were talking about earlier that I do really want to talk about, is that so much of this discourse is actually being structured by a very patriarchal, gendered idea that female people's role is essentially to be nice and kind and accommodating and to give over their... I mean, effectively, they're telling us that we have to give up our existence as a meaningful political class to be nice. Mm. In no world is it reasonable yeah. <laughs> to tell people that they must abandon their existence as a political class and all of their political interests because otherwise they're being unkind. Nobody would try that shit on anyone Any other group, yeah. than women. Women, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
and it because it, it works sometimes you know women it's such a deeply because we're socialized socialization we're yeah. so and i think this is i mean this is the kind of the central point that i really kind of wanted to make is that you've got this movement right that's operating with i think an incredibly superficial concept of gender where gender is denoted by essentially performative very like superficial performative markers like clothes and hairstyles makeup and, and like high makeup heels and, yeah. and like whether you but and, and some superficial um aspects of behavior mm. but it's very notable for example i mean we always make this joke right trans identity in males never seems to manifest in like wanting to clean the toilet mm. or like do the school run or like mentally organize the the timetable for the entire family yeah. it always manifests in an identification with a certain kind of performance of femininity that many women don't have any identification with at all and actually considers to be harmful yeah. but that aside it's there's a very superficial idea i think of what gender is and at the same time the trans rights movement is leveraging a much more fundamental concept of gender, which is that women's role is to service men's needs against women. And many women are complying mm. because women are socialised <laughs> to think that they will... Well, firstly, women are socialised to be compliant and to be kind and to care about other people, right? And secondly, women know that there's very so I mean it's kind of a carrot and a stick thing mm -hmm. right you're socialized to do that it's enforced by the fact that you get patriarchal male approval if you comply yeah. and then on the other side if you're you don't, if you, you, don't, you, will don't be comply. Yeah. you will be punished you will be punished and so that's meaning that a lot of women particularly younger women who have not I mean there's this whole narrative that's being used about how it's just that we're like you know old biddies who don't get it right no what is going on is that we've been inside this system for long enough to be able to see how it works properly and we're also of an age where we've learned to not give that much of a fuck about male approval. Right. Right. At the point at which you stop giving a fuck about male approval, you start being able to see clearly how this whole thing is working. Yeah. And it takes and a while to shake that off, some of these young women, even though they might be dedicated to their feminist ideals, they're still stuck inside a need for male approval and Right, because it takes a very long time, and I'm not saying mm. that women ever fully unpick it. We yeah. don't. But 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 one of the one of the major mechanisms of like feminist consciousness raising is learning to unpick the places mm. where your behaviour has actually been determined by either desire for male approval or fear of male violence. Learning to draw boundaries. <clears throat> learning to understand your own needs and feel able to assert your own needs those kinds of things right and it's something very central I mean, this is what what's so interesting about the whole mechanism right the reason why they demonized the turf yeah is because they knew that women with proper feminist consciousness were going to be the one group of people who were not going to buy this yeah. at all right because all the other women were just sort of because it takes, kind, yeah. and not all of them, no. right? There are a lot of women who are, who are now involved in this battle who are also becoming more radicalised because of the way in which, effectively, the trans rights movement has so um, kind of um, clearly unconcealed the structure of patriarchal gender, right? And they're just right. like, fuck, I thought we, they, we were there and they, we, they think we're human and like, these people have come along and tried to completely erase and like, terrorise us and no one seems to even see the problem, yeah. right? That has radicalised a lot of women. But women who already had fairly well-developed feminist consciousness would, would understand that, that the, 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 the kind of core of this... Feminism is an analysis, yeah, but it's also a practice, right? And the core of that kind of psychological practice is understanding that you have the right to your own needs, you have the right to assert them, and you have the right to draw boundaries, right? One of the core mechanisms of, of feminist practice is saying, no. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to have sex with you. No, I don't want to do this. No, I don't want to take on that extra workload that you're putting on me because you know that I'm female. Mm. Like, and that you think I'm going to do it because I'm, I'm a good compliant person, right? is refusing to be compliant mm. and I think in a movement that was so structured around appeals to kindness and using that they knew that 
women with relatively well-developed feminist consciousness, firstly, would see the mechanism that from, you know, and also had enough social resources to be like, no, mm -hmm. we're putting down a boundary, here is our boundary, <laughs> and the more you try and pressure that boundary, the more we're going to resist. Yeah. And I think effectively that's what happened here, and I think why it happened here more than anyone else might be just because we had, we had better... We had better networks. Yeah, so we were talking about this before, how there's, in Britain there's been a number of groups have sprung up and, and networked and organised and had meetings, uh, of which there's nothing analogous in the United States or Canada, as far as I know. Other countries, feminists... They're doing, they're doing a good job in New Zealand. Right. The New Zealand women... Oh, are, yeah. But they, I've seen the New Zealand feminists say, we're looking to the UK, to what women are doing there. I mean, there's... Yeah, no, um, I mean... Th th it seems quite pivotal what's going on here. I think the British, British feminists sort of saw this early and, and got on the case um, and then got a lot of abuse for it very quickly too. But there's something we, we haven't really touched on which we were talking about before we started which I, I'd really like to explore and you've touched on it sort of indirectly um, during this discussion which is sort of to do with, um, well it's going back to that tweet from Arena and the folk epistemology and particularly young people and this flight away from materiality into virtuality. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've been thinking about quite a bit. Why these we're finding ourselves yeah. in this very strange territory that nobody could have imagined when I was younger. You know, you, if you told people this is what would be going on in 2019, there, there'd be people in courtrooms defending the existence of biological sex. No, anyway, this is actually, this is um, actually happening. So what's going on? One of the things I've noticed is among uh, a younger generation who've grown up in an entirely internet-based um, culture they've been able to create profiles. They create their MySpace profile, their Facebook profile, their Instagram profile, right. and they have an avatar, right. and they might operate in computer gaming environments, like these mul massive multiplayer gaming environments, all these sort of second life type environments. Um, there's a great enthusiasm for anything virtual, or augmented reality, these kinds of things. And then there's role-playing games. Which, yeah. I mean, that started in the 80s with just dice and you know tabletop stuff, but it's all, it's all, it's all about creating another identity and living it out yeah and then there's live action role playing which right. has come out of that and there's right. cosplay yeah and th these are these are huge things um and so the idea is you can be and also there's this um, this vacuous american it actually is the same thing as the american play. dream you can be, you can be whatever you, can be, you want you can be anything you want yeah. to be who yeah. can tell you can't tell me i'm not you yeah. know so and then that's been extended to overwrite the physical substrate of reality mm -hmm. that we're grounded in so you can't tell me I'm not female you can't tell me I'm not you know 11 years old right uh, you know I can be whatever I want to be it's very it's very interesting actually because it reminds me when I um, was teaching in the states one of the one of the phrases that students would always use you'd, you'd sit them there and you'd be like what do you think about Aristotle's like concept of happiness? Mm. And very often the response would be, "Who is he to say?" Right, right. And and I was like, I was like, well, firstly it's Aristotle, so that's <laughs> probably Aristotle. that's probably not the best place to start. I mean, I I agree, but also it's like, no, the question isn't, does any particular individual have the authority? Right. The question is. Is the idea good? Yeah. Right? Does yeah. it make sense? Right? Mm -hmm. Who who am I to say? I mean I had this conversation with someone the other day about this, right? And they were like they did exactly the same move. Like what you know, you're setting yourself up as the authority and I'm like, I'm not the authority, take it up with evolution. Yeah. Right? Like as if everything in reality is is determined by our own intentionality. Yeah. Right? And it's not, right? Human sexual dimorphism doesn't exist because I say it exists. It exists because it's a material phenomenon, mm, yeah. <laughs> which we have managed to, um, you know, uh, use. I think, I mean, I wrote about this the other day. Firstly, there are scientific ways of establishing the coherence of that concept. Mm. Secondly, or thirdly, we have used, people don't understand, right, concepts function because they allow us to meaningfully interact with the world. A concept like sex, which is one of the oldest concepts that we have, right? It's right there on like cuneiform, Sumerian cuneiform. Yeah, and tablets. it goes back into it the pre-human. Pre I mean, yeah. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tree, earth, sky, sun level basic yeah. material shit, right? That concept's been there 
from human prehistory up until now and it's been very very stable there's different ways a lot of the arguments that are used about the difference between the two sex and the one sex model right but the two sex and the one sex model were basically just in in ancient history right women were defined as defective or inferior men okay and then later on in the enlightenment it was understood that they were two different things okay. right? right but they were still pertaining to a perceived difference Clear between male Irish and female people yeah, that yeah. people saw right this is one of the things that's used in the colonialism yeah. argument as well but anyway that concept has been very very stable at least insofar as it allows us to accurately pick out and interact with a part of material existence mm. the fact that that concept has lasted so long tells us and that we can it's, use it to do concept. all kinds of things yeah. like divide sports and do medicine and like work out crime statistics and all kinds of stuff is telling us that it's identifying and mapping onto something that is meaningful and useful right mm. and like the idea that those types of aspects of our material existence can simply be overridden by essentially I ideas that our ideas determine the nature of reality mm. that's a um firstly it's a very dangerous idea it's actually a very long-standing human idea i think it's particularly i think you're right it's particularly common in this generation and seems remarkably plausible to this generation in so far as they were brought up in a virtual environment. Yeah. And I don't think they have the same relation to material reality. They're no. getting further and further away from it. I mean, all, all of the stats that get <coughs> quoted about kids not being able to name any plants and animals and trees anymore, they just know brands and Pokemon characters. You know, they're, right. they're, kids are getting more and more alienated from the, right. what you could call the material, the material living world. world. Right. You know, and there, no and, there, is, and there is a strand of thinking, right, on the left that seems to think that that's fine and that actually what we want to do is we need to go like this you probably haven't come across the xeno feminism stuff yeah. but there's there's um it's a kind of rationalist transhumanist form of feminism and there is an idea that actually among some people that the what we want to do is dominate nature harder be more be more dematerialized. Oh, it's like the cyborg feminist thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, alienate, yeah. Alienate ourselves further. Further, just right? keep pushing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and I think actually in some sense this is fundamentally why I had such a problem with trans ideology when I first saw it. I come from a school of feminism that has always argued that the fundamental um, philosophical structure of patriarchy is dematerialization. Mm. Right, is the desire to transcend our material limits and you see this in like judeo-christianity for example or in plato or whatever in a certain sense trans ideology is just a reiteration of like the resurrection right it's like a desire for us to transcend the limits of mortal existence yeah, kind of into a kind of into a new and to be of... reborn into um a kind of eternity where we're not mortal and we're not vulnerable and we're not dependent and we're not just like little little animal -y creatures who are like snuffling around on the face of a planet which is the truth mm. right um and i find it very kind of disturbing and telling that at this point where <clears throat> we have all of these problems in the world which are created by the crisis of like patriarchal capitalism and which are to do with the fact that our economic system has basically completely taken leave of material reality right. and we're running the economy on like fucking fairy dust and god knows yeah, what. So we, yeah, so for example, like, as we said earlier, the growth economy and the idea that we just keep growing forever, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. You only have to think about it for a fraction of a second. There's right. finite resources There's and yet the model resources. does not... The model, the, model, the model does not take that into account. So we actually don't. We actually don't know. I mean, and it, it's more serious than that in this economy, in that the wealth is actually just coming out of nowhere, mm. right? At the moment, it's like we used to have at least an understanding that our economic system was based on certain kinds of material, like classical growing, Marxism, growing crops and manufacturing, means things of, and, means of yeah. production. Yeah. Nobody actually even knows what the means of means of production are now or the means of production are semi-virtual yeah right? yeah i mean it's exotic financial instruments and things exotic like financial instruments 
data management, like financialization, uh, software, uh, Amazon, like these things are, I mean, Amazon's kind of semi-material, but some things well, are most, not. Most of the, what they do is actually now virtual services, even though they, they look like a book, online bookstore. Right. The vast majority of their turnover is actually from AI services now, because they've got such a huge data. Right, right. because they're probably. selling, because actually, the means of production now is selling data. Yeah, yeah. Right, or, it's selling data, data yeah. seller and manipulating data so that when we can be sold and manipulated, mm -hmm. right? And so we live in this culture, people, like, the entire structure of the culture is basically not materialised. Yeah, it's sort of fracturing, <laughs> fracturing off from the material plane into this other it, it took, it took. I mean, the, the financial crisis was the, was the best example of this, mm. right? So the financial crisis was produced essentially by this, by dematerialization, by the creation of a huge bubble, yeah. right? There were some material aspects to it in terms of building, right? But the structures that were built on top of that, which were fueling it, were all non, were all virtual, yeah. right? Then everyone spent a huge amount of money that didn't exist, right? And then the whole thing collapsed. And at that point, I, in my infinite naivety, hoped that materiality would reassert itself. Yeah, people right? go, whoa, what have we people been doing? People go, whoa, what's going on? Just We're running this whole thing on, like, yeah, on, yeah. on... But what they decided to do was just chuck more money into it mm. and, and restart it and just keep it going. At which point, I think basically, I mean, it happened before, but decisively from 2008 onward, our entire political system is running completely unrelated to what is happening in the material it's world true, entirely yeah. yeah and at the same time politics has been completely hollowed out right mm. because actually these mechanisms of, of virtual financialization which are operating at a global level right individual countries with their individual political material interests have no have, have can't exert any control on the systems that they're actually dependent on so the interests yeah. of financial global capital are determining D dictating people's lives dictating everywhere yeah people's lives everywhere <clears throat> so every, so everything is completely twisted right in terms of the actual structure of our existence then we've got a whole group, bunch of kids who uh, were brought up on the internet don't understand the material limits of their of their existence have not actually been taught to engage in the type of material activities that produce human well-being yeah right yeah. like going for walks and making things with their hands yeah. they can't concentrate because their attention spans have been completely split up yeah. by the type of information that they're receiving. Super fast edited children's cartoons the, the, or whatever. The, yeah. the, and flicking around on the internet yeah, constantly. Millions of browser and like windows. expecting to get like dopamine hits constantly. Yeah. Like so that's totally um, messed up their neural pathways. They aren't capable of concentrating. Schools decided not to instill concentration in them, which is also a massive problem because if you can't concentrate, you can't go into flow and you can't produce um, complicated thoughts, mm. you can't produce complicated creative products. You can't analyse difficult ideas. You can't analyse yeah, difficult yeah. ideas. Everything's like memeified and they're all, yeah. they're, they're, their brains are all split up. Like they think like Tumblr, basically. Mm. The whole of trans ideology is but, disseminated on Tumblr yeah. and the structure of the thinking is Tumblrized. It's like a bunch of memes just stuck next to each other that yeah. don't actually make sense and completely fall apart when you try and make a coherent Set of yeah, because there was never, there was never any, not, there was nothing coherent to start with. There's never been anything coherent to compare it to. So you're not expecting to create something coherent if you've grown up in that. Coherence is, is not really. No, a, coherence is not a thing. A thing that you, right? you adhere to. And they don't understand that what we're objecting. One of the, well, there are many things that we're objecting to. That one of the things that we're objecting to, in addition to the dematerialization, is that the whole thing is completely incoherent. Yeah. Right. It has no internal consistency whatsoever. You know, it's like the whole thing about sex, like. You need sex in order for trans identity to actually make sense, but at the same time you deny it. So trans identity yeah. is basically... It's like what are you transitioning to is the right. question. So yeah. trans identity is basically based both on the necessity and the denial of sex yeah. simultaneously. And that's what the assigned male at birth, assigned female at yeah, birth... Yeah, which was this last year I'm seeing this more and more. The BBC's using this now. No, it? I mean, it's, yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah. Like, you, you are randomly assigned a sex culturally. Yeah. Like, no, you're not. And, and just, I've got to throw in this bizarre thing that happened with the penguin. So a penguin, a penguin <laughs> chick was born at London Zoo. There was a <laughs> Audience are just going to be like by this, this point they're so, just going to be like yeah. what? what? But no, honestly, check it out. I'll put some clips up on the screen. But yeah, Penguin was born at, at London Zoo and apparently brought up by a same-sex penguin couple 
I don't know much about penguins. Um, that's fine. That's if, fine. Gay, yeah. if gay penguins want to have kids, that's yeah. great. But um, like, but in any case, they decide that pe the London Zoo wanted to jump on this bandwagon and, and get some points, some brownie points, announced and sent spokespeople to the news channels to be up here on TV and claim, in all seriousness, it wasn't a joke, it wasn't a cute little April Fool thing, that this penguin chick would be the world's first penguin not to be assigned a gender at birth. See, when you exactly. say assign gender roles, what yeah. gender roles can you assign to a penguin? Exactly, and I think that's that's the key thing. You don't really see it in the animal kingdom. Um, there is a little bit of um, conversation going on at the moment in terms of whether we might be seeing gender roles in some um, higher primates, um, much like we're often compared to other higher primates because we're so similar. But with penguins, there's a there's a difference between sex differences and with gender roles. Um, penguins would have to have some sort of society where other penguins were potentially putting pressure on little baby penguins um, that they should be more masculine or more feminine and, mm. and things like that. So what we wanted to do was um, give guests that opportunity to not be putting those assumptions onto a little Gen Zoo chick. <laughs> now it's like, sorry, what about all the penguins in Antarctica? Nobody's there signing anything. They just get on with it. They just get on with it. And um, some of them get pregnant and some of them don't. And it's very strange. So to start, you know, one of the one of my uh, ways of sort of objecting to some of the nonsense around the, the ideology that's afoot at the moment is to, um, you know, say for example, denying biological. Is it claiming that biological sex was invented as a result of colonialism or after the Enlightenment? It's like, well, what about all the other non-human mammals? You know, what are they doing? Asparagus. That's that's. Oh yeah. Yeah. What's that? No, that that that's 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 the point that Emma Hilton, fond of Beatles, always oh. makes. Oh. Any definition. Asparagus is sexed, right? Okay. So apparently. Any definition that you want to come up with for the concept of sex has to work for asparagus. For asparagus. Ah, brilliant. She tried that on Alice Roberts. Right. What about so, asparagus? So asparagus is like the, the anti-clownfish kind of. It's the, the anti-clownfish. Yeah. Um, so, um, no, I mean, I think the thing is, is that there is this general dematerialization, which is also being combined with various things that are interfering with their ability to have to form to form common I mean it's, there's a lot of factors they're not being taught to write properly in school mm. um, they're not I mean and this is partly because of it's it's actually not in capitalism's interests for people to be able to string together complicated thoughts um, they don't want us thinking right no, not. so <laughs> thinking thinking is a is at this point in history in itself a radical and heretical thing to do yeah. um, and um, so they're living in this kind of virtualized world. They understand, I think, quite clearly that everything is going to shit. Mm. There's a thing that I call futurity shutdown, right? So effectively, as a result of the financial crisis, because what happened in the financial crisis effectively is that the future was sucked into the present and, right. and pissed up the wall, right? right? Yeah. Because that's what credit does. That's what credit does. Credit is debt, mm. right? You're spending so your if you, you, if you take money. Yeah, yeah. You're spending the future's money. You're yeah. sucking the money from the future into the present. And then you're, you know, and then small numbers of people are taking it and running away with it. So essentially what they've, we're, we're kind of in this weird temporal state, actually, when, where history is happening, but, but, um, the kinds of structures that we would need in order to provide hope and in order to provide meaningful ways of living for those young people are not there. Um, they have <clears throat> remarkably high levels of mental distress. They're suffering from very extreme anxiety, d depression disorders. This has become very, very normalised in universities now. Yeah. It's very normal for my friends in universities to receive emails from their students saying, "I can't, I didn't do the essay because I'm so because my suicidal ideation is too bad." Yeah. Like that's yeah. so. So there's a lot of distress. There's a there's an absence of hope. They're living in a weirdly virtualised environment. Um, and then along has come this ideology that appears to offer some form of remedy mm. to the situation that they can cling on to, right? So that if we just allow everyone to be a million, billion different genders, somehow all um. of these other material problems, <laughs> everything will be solved. But it's what's, what's telling and kind of terrible about it is that the problems that we're confronting 
are because of dematerialization, because we're not anchored in um, materially grounded processes. Yeah, that's what's caused it all to go to shit that's and what, make them that's want to escape from it. That's yeah. what's caused it all to go to shit. The fact that patriarchal capitalism is fundamentally <clears throat> based on a system in which it won't acknowledge its material, in which we don't acknowledge our material dependencies, we particularly don't acknowledge our material dependency on the earth, we don't ethically recognise and deal ethically with how we use resources, mm. how we distribute them, like any of these yeah. things. And now we think, say, the denial of motherhood, which is a really profound, you know, kind of on a sort of mass psychology level, we're seeing within the you know, sort of trans ideology, this denial of... This, you know, every time this is a Mother's Day, there's an attack on, on mother. No, but, but this is this is ac this is actually the core of it. Like, yeah. I think the attitude of trans ideology to mothers is actually completely central and axiomatic to the whole structure, because I would say, from a philosophical perspective, <clears throat> our refusal to recognise our material limits, our material dependencies, our material vulnerabilities throws comes up in culture as a as a inability to recognize our dependence on on women's bodies mm. right that's ultimately what's going on in patriarch in patriarchy right yeah. M masculine invulnerability cannot process its dependence on the bodies of women right so that's why they are appropriated and erased and all of these kinds of mechanisms that we see Trans ideology is effectively a repetition and reinscription of a patriarchal idealist refusal to recognise material dependency and material limits. Mm. And then that like, kind of represents itself or is thrown up centrally in trans ideology by all of the screaming about women talking about their reproductive functions and how like, it's so terrible that we think that we've got you know that our existence has got something to do with our reproductive capacities and particularly with the kind of hatred that's thrown at mm -hmm. mothers the way in which mum's nets denigrated yeah. like all of all of this kind of stuff and then of course like you know the icing on the cake is all the fantasies about womb, womb trans transplants womb trans that's the ultimate yeah and this is i mean <clears throat> Janice Raymond, her book, The Transsexual Empire, from like 79, that's now seen as a kind of Mein Kampf kind of evil text. Right. I don't know how, how um, well it stands up as a kind of piece of feminist scholarship, but she was, you know, she was a student of Mary Daly, as far as I know. Yeah. And she was sounding the alarm that this is, you know, patriarchy, given the opportunity, will attempt to do this. Right. It will, if it, you know, that's the natural logic, it will attempt to undermine women's... Womb, womb transplantation yeah. is the absolute apotheosis of patriarchal logic, yeah. right? The fundamental structure has always been about the inability of patriarchal male subjectivity to tolerate its dependence on female reproductive capacities mm -hmm. because it undermines the conceit. If, you've, if you structure patriarchal masculinity around the idea of invulnerability, you can't process material dependence inside that structure mm. so what you have to do always is this simultaneous gesture of erasing it i.e refusing to grant it recognition yeah. and then appropriating, appropriating it because yeah you've you, got to have you, it for you, yourself because recognition i mean this is why recognition matters right because if you don't recognize the difference of something then when you appropriate it there's no oh there's nothing there right which is what's going on with the erasure of women in general mm. here like oh we can just appropriate your resources because we're the same as you because there is no meaningful no difference, difference because you yeah. don't really exist so this that's why erasure is bad right erasure is bad because it's the mechanism that allows for appropriation so getting to this point where they're now we're in a, we're in a state where we have like hundreds of thousands of homeless people sleeping on the streets and kids going to school without breakfast right and they want to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds seeing if they can plug a womb into a male person's body mm. right it's obscene on the basis of resource allocation yeah. for one thing it's obscene in so far as women's bodies like we're not car engines yeah right like it's a very object-oriented thing, isn't it? It's for a, for a man to see a woman's body as just a set of components that can be removed and recombined. And removed and, and recombined, yeah. like like it's a fucking carburetor, yeah. right? Um, and 
it's obscene because of like you actually gonna implant a baby and experiment yeah. to see if you can do that and it's obscene in so far as it is like the pure kind of instantiation of the fundamental death drive of patriarchy yeah. basically like because everything has to be the thing about patriarchy is that we talk about recognition of materiality and recognition of our dependence is because that is a recognition of the structure that supports life mm -hmm. right the the issue about why um, dematerialization is a is an issue right so if you think about judeo-christianity right is a good example the only place where you are entirely free of material dependence and vulnerability is death right, right. that's why christianity is structured around that's why the why religions are structured around a fantasy of the afterlife where all of those material limits don't exist mm. right because within the structure of of embodied lived existence right materiality is the support of life if you try to dematerialize you're effectively fucking up the mechanisms that are supporting life yeah. and the desire to take leave of ma the material plane and like transcend it, it's a, is a death drive mm. right trans ideology is a death cult right in the same way that judeo christianity is a death cult ultimately right it, it in in the drive towards transcendence i'm not mm. saying all aspects of judeo christianity <laughs> yeah are, right but the drive towards material transcendence or the transcendence of the material rather yeah is a death drive and somehow this kind of image of attempting to like appropriate women's wombs and then plug them into male bodies and try and grow a child in this kind of Frankensteinian way is a kind of absolute representation both of like the appropriative urge that is underpinning the whole thing and the lack of respect for life yeah. fundamentally it's just fundamental disrespect for life life is more complicated and um, we, we need to accept that we're not in control of it we don't know how to make life Right. Yeah, that's what that's the, the male invulnerability that you know it cannot stand the fact that we don't understand, you know, the fact we can't make a, a living cell in a lab, right. the fact we can't make right. life, right, is a huge blow to the collective male Western scientific right. psyche. And I think and I think this is interesting when we talk about, you know, I don't want I'm not I want to essentialize women. I don't think it's true, right? But I think human subjects who are positioned outside of identification with patriarchal male subjectivity mm. are much better at having some fucking humility and respect for life yeah. than like patriarchal male subjectivity is is I mean all of this destruction this is what's driving me crazy right we're at this point in history where there is all of this destruction around us like the planet is literally on fucking fire the ice caps are melting um, Brexit, Trump, all of these kind of sovereigntist things that are being thrown up by the chaos, right? Ultimately, these are all these are all symptoms, right, of the fact that we are running on a program that is structured by a kind of idea of patriarchal invulnerability that has com that is completely unable to express respect for life, mm -hmm. and the result is that they're killing everything. <laughs> Not surprising, yeah. <laughs> And that is the thing about a death drive, is that you end up choosing death over life because you can't accept, you don't have the humility hmm. to accept that you are not all powerful. Yeah. And that life actually is more complicated and more powerful than you are and you're not in charge of it. And trans ideology is just a kind of really weird manifestation of that. But it's in some ways, it's one of the reasons I'm kind of fascinated by it, is it's it's a kind of mass unconcealment, really, mm. of that fundamental. Yeah, you can you structure. can see what's going on underneath if you look closely. Yeah, which is why I think it's causing. I mean, it's causing a lot of radicalization, and it's causing it. It, it gives. You know, it's kind of insane that on the one hand, it would make sense, 
at the one hand at the point where all of these kind of catastrophes of patriarchal capitalist masculinity are throwing up these symptoms feminist speech has been pushed out of the academy pushed out of like because actually we're like we could actually explain what's going on here mm. like i can tell you why this is happening um yeah all the voices that are needed right now to explain what's going on are the ones that are being most loudly sh shouted down right yeah and at the same time there's a kind of weird inverse mechanism which is that because that shutting down is causing a lot of radicalization there is actually a really really vital growing women's movement mm. in this country right now yeah. and there are lots of women who are like what the fuck is going on and are really hungry to understand yeah. and are receptive to it because trans ideology is such an incredible demonstration of it mm. that you know you could otherwise have maybe carried on for another few decades kind of pretending that patriarchy was more or less sorted and wasn't really a big problem well yeah because because to some extent like that was concealed and i've all i mean i became a feminist because i actually wanted to understand the fundamental i was i was from very young like this this world is like this is a mess mm. right and i wanted to understand why it was such a mess and I ended up with like feminist metaphysics because it gave me the best like all of that stuff about idealism and death drive it gave yeah. me the best way of understanding how the mechanism was functioning and i think you know if we want to like try and pull out a silver lining of this awful situation it's that it's provided a kind of wake-up call which has allowed women who um are fundamentally on the side of life mm. not because because they're women but because maybe partly because they're women because you know we have babies but um also because we're not positioned as patriarchal male subjects right mm. so because we're not positioned as patriarchal male subjects we're actually allowed to engage with the world in in a way that's less dominating and that allows us to i think develop some humility and respect that i think we could all do with yeah absolutely there we go. Right, I think that's a, that's a good note to end on. But before we completely end, you're saying there's growing women's movement in this country. You set up something called the Institute for Feminist Thought. I did in March. So in this, I did, and this is in response to that, and this is part of. Well, that. it was partly it was partly because um, it was partly because radical feminism, or what I would call any kind of serious, materially based, structural, challenging feminism, is being pushed out. Mm of the academy and replaced with what I like to call like intersectional buzzword smoothie feminism, which actually has very little substantive content. Mm. It's a lot of virtue signaling and not much challenging the power structure, really. Right, so that's your third wave <laughs> feminism, it's, it's yeah, the current so, flavour, yeah. Um, and um, I was getting a lot of women in universities and other places writing to me and saying that they they were distressed by the fact that there was no feminism being taught and they didn't know where to go to to learn feminism or that they were in gender studies classes and weren't being taught any feminism um so it was partly for that reason and also because i was aware that there was a growing number of women who were becoming radicalized who wanted to understand what was happening and that they needed some uh they needed an opportunity to be able to return to you know the fundamental structures of second wave feminist thinking and to do that uh in dialogue with other women basically right. also to to produce some support because women are being gaslit um and the best antidote to being gaslit is to to sit in a room with a bunch of other people who've experienced the same thing and go no yeah, how would you how do no, you define no, gaslighting no, no you're not crazy I, I i had to sort of learn what gaslighting was by kind of the way it was big through context really it's, well it comes through a play right okay. right it comes through a play originally in which a man tried to drive his wife crazy by turning down the lights okay in which their house gas, which were gas time, yeah, okay. um and it getting darker and darker and him denying that it was getting darker oh, so she thought she was going crazy so she okay. thought she was going crazy right right so basically gaslighting is a particular abusive psychological mechanism in which you try and drive someone insane by undermining their perception of reality. Yeah. And, and that's why you're seeing that word being used a lot. Well, because, we're, because women are being gaslit on a mass scale. Yeah. And there was a really amazing example that came up this morning from um, an internal NHS document mm. in which um, they were talking about how to manage 
you know, the mixed sex wards that are actually not mixed sex wards. And and um, the NHS has been completely captured. They've okay, been, so they've, been a, you, they've been like stonewalled up. The UK Wesley. National Health Service has basically said that it's hospital wards, which have traditionally been sex segregated for very good reasons, are now basically you just identify into the one you want to go. They're, in, they're so. still sex segregated, but, but on a self ID basis. Yeah, so so there, there were some internal you, there were some internal NHS guidelines in which basically they were talking about how to deal with a female patient who. Um, was saying that was distressed because there was a male-bodied person on the ward and it was classic gaslighting it was basically like patient I'm upset because there's there's a male person over there and then nurse was basically instructed to tell that person that that person wasn't male and they were wrong yeah. so and, and and you've got women on wards in a state of vulnerability very often ill some of them are going to have been recently experienced something traumatic um, plus all of the trauma that women are carrying anyway um, one of my doctor friends who I'm in touch with said that you know large numbers of women in those kinds of acute wards are suffering certain kinds of mental health problems mm. all kinds of stuff right so what you do under those circumstances is you just gaslight somebody mm. and it's the same situation with domestic violence shelters right you've got I mean domestic Gaslighting is one of the primary mechanisms that, that um, functions inside domestically violent relationships. And you've now got a situation in which women could flee from a domestically violent situation. Being gaslit by their husband or partner. Being gaslit yeah. by their husband and their partner. Get to a refuge where they expect to have their understanding of reality. Because the way in which you help people who've been gaslit is you reaffirm their version of reality, right? And you tell them they're not crazy and that someone's been abusing them. You then take them to, to a refuge and the staff in the refuge then start telling you that, that bloke this that, that bloke the over there is, that bloke female. over there with a the beard is female. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking horrifying. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean I saw one of the extreme forms of gaslighting showed up in The Guardian a week or two ago where some a couple of, in fact a couple of early twenty year old male heterosexuals basically were writing in a piece about the how lesbian sex was oh, that's superior right. to yeah they couldn't find any they couldn't find any female lesbians um yeah two two male i mean this is a thing it's not a joke it used to be a joke you know i've been men you would think you would think it was a joke um, it's and, not and, a joke the guardian newspaper which is you know supposed to be reputable ran this piece and not specifically in a trans context it was just lesbian sex is is like, just lesbian sex but, but i oh, will ask these, these the best the best the best, the best people to ask about lesbian yeah. sex so that's that, gaslighting yeah. it's it's really not on um, please the please entire stop. the entire the entire trans rights movement is an exercise in mass gaslighting yeah and again well, i suppose we need to end by just reiterating we're not trying to demonize or undermine or hate on anybody this isn't about people's choices or lifestyles or, or you know how they identify or any of that but it's to do with public policy it's to do with politics and power and um, and it's to do with women's right to name their own oppression. women's boundaries yeah it's about women's boundaries women's right um, to have boundaries women's right to express their own needs and to name their own reality yeah so um any any women interested in the um institute of feminist thought they can find you online presumably yeah if you yeah. go to my website jenclairejones.com there's a tab on the top right. of there that will take you to the okay. institute yeah. and i do um introduction courses six week introduction courses mm -hmm. um which are basically an introduction overview to second wave feminism and then I, I'm working on doing a second course at the moment, which is going to be about the stuff we talked about, about the psychology of, uh, and the like, philosophical underpinnings of gender. So all the stuff right. about materiality okay. and uh, entitlement and narcissism mm -hmm. and how that all ties together. Okay, well, I think you, if you're interested to know more about that, this, this is the person to talk to. Um, she's got some amazing essays up on her website as well that have been accumulating over the last few years, if you want to catch up on what's been going on um, and a very active Twitter feed which is very entertaining as well as informative and incisive. So thank you Jane for being on the uh, Reality Report. It's a pleasure, thank okay. you. Oh, great. Bye. Thanks for watching.